let's start the business meeting with a minute of silence for those Californians who died either in the north or mostly in the north and also in Southern California due to the fires. Mr. McAllister and Drew both have been up to Paradise. You want to say a few words? <coughs> so, um, Drew, uh, Bowen and I went up there Saturday before last, so a little over a week ago, and um, uh, at that point they had not allowed residents back. Uh, so it was kind of an eerie uh, experience, really. I mean, uh, I have to hand it to pg &E, really, uh, to Valerie for putting that trip together, Joe Wilson for shepherding us around and really uh, showing us um, the extensive nature of the damage, I and mean, we drove all over Paradise, and you know it's a quite large incorporated area, and uh, just the devastation. I mean, you've all seen it on on video, and uh, I, you know, obviously um, afterwards in a blue sky, you know, beautiful fall day was kind of uh, a little bit disconcerting, really, to w view the devastation. But it, uh, I had actually done, uh, you know, a couple decades ago, uh, assessments of of grid impacts of hurricane of a hurricane in the Dominican Republic. And that was my reference point, really. Just the devastation there was tremendous, but it was it was all kind of you could make sense of it. It was like everything was sort of just snapped over in the same direction, and it looked like hurricane damage. And here, all the trees were still standing, and it was just kind of very it was very strange, you know. The the combustible stuff was the buildings, and so the, all the buildings were gone, but most of the trees were still there. Obviously, some of the, a lot of those trees have to be taken out, but um, just the just the human toll and the amount of um, destruction was just. Phenomenal. I mean, you all saw the wind and stuff. So basically, the embers just just got blown from one building to the next building. The most combustible thing was the buildings, the the, the stick frame buildings. You know, cinder block and stucco did okay, but just everything else was gone. And so, just plot after plot was um, just the the foundation, the perimeter foundation. You know, the the chimney, the you know carcasses of the major appliances. You know, the fridge and the, and the washer dryer if they had them and and the car, and that was it. Everything else was just completely, completely burned. And so there weren't many people around, so the deer were kind of, you know, frolicking around and eating in the front yards that were still green. It was very bizarre. Um, but clear, and, and uh, the, the amount of effort that, uh, and the, the, with the rapidity that PG&E has put together their base camp and put, you know, 1,200 people and, and their crews from all over the country and just a lot of work with tree removal is just going crazy. Um, just the focused attention was really notable as well. So, um, I mean, I really hope that when people came back, they were able to get a little bit of closure. But uh, it's hard to see, really, um, you know, putting the pieces back together quickly. I, I um, the the, o the other experience I had with fires was down in Southern California in 2007, where we tried to run a um, well, we ran a uh, um, with some ratepayer funds. We ran some programs to get people to rebuild green and sustainable, to help them do solar, help them do efficiency when they build back, you know, build more sustainably. And I'd say it was successful to an extent, but it really wrestled with uh, the reality that I think we're definitely going to see here too, which is uh, it just every situation is different. You know, some people are going to choose to rebuild, some people are not. Some people are fully insured, many people are not fully insured. Um, uh, you know, it's obviously a, a different demographic than, than you know, than other fires. Um, and so we'll just have to see what people choose to do. But uh, it just it's onesies and twosies. It's, it's, it's difficult to see sort of, you know, order as you go through in the next three, five years. We'll see, you know, how, how and whether people rebuild. Um, but uh, I think maybe we can take some instruction from what's happening in Sonoma and how they've gotten going. What, but, uh, what uh, portion of the 
new homes that are going to be rebuilt will be done under our new standards? Do you have a sense? Of we don't know. I mean, if, if that's a great question. Yeah. I mean, I think we're that's that's one of the big um, one of the big uh, unknowns. Um, the new standards, uh, you know, which we'll probably t I'll definitely talk about in my comments at the end. Uh, they go into effect um, on January one of twenty twenty. So to the extent rebuilds can pull permits before then, they will be under our current standards. And then if they pull permits after that, they'll be under the 2020, 2019 standards. Um, but uh, uh, you know, either way, I think we certainly need to provide some special attention to the building apartments in, uh, in, in Paradise and in Butte County <coughs> to just help, help them navigate uh, whichever code they're operating under, but uh, just make sure that 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 the, the energy piece of the code isn't the issue. I mean, I think they have lots of other things to wrestle with. I mean, fire protection obviously is a big one. Lots of pieces of the plumbing code, um, uh, you know, are require navigation, and the building departments are always stressed. And those building departments certainly will be stressed because they'll be dealing with a lot of rebuilds. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, probably we'll see a wave of permits just before 2020, and then as they trickle in after that, we'll see uh, permits. You know a few months later sort of begin to pick up again. But most people who are planning to rebuild will probably make an effort to pull their permit before the, the new code puts it, comes in place. That's what we see every cycle, really. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the other piece of this, and, and I certainly uh, the challenge uh, is a huge one, and, and just the personal uh, impact on all the families here is just really incomprehensible. But I do also think it's an opportunity to uh, build a community that is more resilient and do that in an intentional way and hopefully marshal some resources to help them do that. I mean, I, I don't think you're going to find all those resources locally. Uh, so it would you know, help to, I think we absolutely need to have uh, that broader conversation about how we direct some resources to, um, to make sort of a model rebuild effort in that place because I think uh, it certainly needs it. Uh, it's a part of the state that um, is you know, less than sort of the affluent Bay Area, extended Bay Area. And so I think we need to uh, sort of take them in, in that context and try to help as, as best we can. Just the scale of it was incredible. And, you know, tens of thousands of people still displaced. Um, and it's going to take years for them to trickle back. Uh, so uh, everyone should really see it. I mean, if there's some way that uh, uh, obviously everybody can't go through this, this site. And uh, they've had security issues. It's been quite a daunting task just to get the uh, the grid rebuilt they're starting to build back um, the well they actually are far down the road on they've done all the transmission coming in uh, and then the distribution grid they're actually building back at, at, at record pace I mean it's quite amazing to watch how quickly they're getting the, the distribution grid back there are about 1200 homes that are still standing and habitable and people are now allowed to go back to or will be soon and so um, PG&E is trying to get the power to those homes obviously it's a small fraction of the homes that were there before um, and so there's not going to be a lot of revenue from these customers, but they have to get them back uh, connected. Uh, and then what's the plan for the gas system is also a big question. You know, I think building it back so that people can have heat in the near term is kind of the quickest option, but also, you know, in the context of our electrification um, kind of goals and our decarbonization goals, um, uh, decarbonization and, and as a strategy for decarbonization and electrification, um, it's, it's, you know, they may be using sort of some near-term solutions like dropping in CNG facilities and, and um, you know, uh, pro encouraging propane for the, for the near term so they can kind of figure out what makes sense for the long term. Um, so uh, really, you know, hopefully we can make an opportunity out of it and, and um, you know, help extract some lessons because, uh, you know, this is only going to keep happening. We all know climate change is happening. We all know that these, these uh, fires are... Uh, you know, these extreme weather events are going to continue and get probably more extreme over time. So I think uh, we have to learn from this lesson and hopefully we, or learn from this event and take some lessons from it. So um, you know, hopefully we can do that in an organized way, in a way that helps that community recover. Uh, but uh, I, have to, I mean, if Drew, you want to add anything, uh, just the impact of this trip was, uh, that was pretty, you can, you can understand why the people who were there are quite shell-shocked. I mean, it's like p the, some of those folks are going to have PTSD. It's, it's really just tremendous. Um, the impact um, that uh, just it has on the people that are there rebuilding, but certainly the people who went through it, I imagine, are just, uh, you know, that's something obviously they'll never forget. But uh, uh, I, I was uh, just, after a while, you just get overloaded. You can't take, you can't take it in because the scale was just so big. So, so Drew, you want to add something? Okay, great. Thanks, Chair.
Yeah. So let's go on to the consent items. We're going to split the consent into two pieces. First, let's deal with everything but D, and then we'll deal with D. Uh, move say? everything but D. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So this, these pass unanimously. So on item 1D, I have received travel reimbursements from the Western Interstate Energy Board for my participation in their meetings, and uh, therefore I will recuse myself from consideration of item 1D. I move item 1D. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So this item passes. Um, Four to zero if one abstaining. Right. Let's go on to item two. There we go. It looked like it was on. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Eric Vierkamp. I work in the compliance unit of the Siting Transmission and Environmental Protection Division. I'm the project manager for the Geysers Geothermal Project's petition to amend to make identical modifications to the final decisions for three projects, Quicksilver, Socrates, and Grant. I have with me this morning uh, members of staff. I have Jared Babula. I have um, Brett folks and also Tao Zhang or uh, Nancy Fletcher, excuse me, to answer any questions uh, if, if necessary. The three projects, Quicksilver, Socrates, and Grant, are operational geothermal facilities located in Sonoma and Lake Counties and were formerly known as PG&E Geysers 16, 18, and 20, respectively. The petition to amend requests three things. First, it would authorize the replacement of temporary portable emergency diesel engines with stationary permanent emergency diesel engines for the cooling tower wet down systems. The new diesel engines would help aid in preventing fire damage such as happened with the cooling towers at Grant and Socrates in the 2015 Valley Fire. Secondly, air quality conditions of certification would be modified and reorganized to ensure that the decision would agree with the applicable air district language for Quicksilver, Socrates, and Grant. Finally, two new worker safety conditions of certification would be added to maintain conformance with the fire safety requirements. In order to provide clarity and eliminate confusion between Air District conditions and Energy Commission conditions of certification, staff has revised, renumbered, and reordered the conditions of certification for consistency and to gain conformance with Air District permits for the projects. Staff and the applicant worked cooperatively in two public workshops on November 8th and November 15th to reach agreement on the substance of the new Worker Safety 1 condition, which in a separate process would ensure an appropriate timetable to complete recommissioning of the existing fire suppression system and cooling tower wet down system that will improve both systems. Staff determined that with the adoption of the amended conditions of certification, the proposed petition will not have a significant effect on the environment and will not affect the project's ability to continue to comply with applicable laws. Staff is recommending approval of the petition to install new permanent diesel engines and pumps for the cooling tower wet down systems at Quicksilver, Socrates, and Grant, along with the new proposed conditions of certification. I would be happy to take any questions you may have, and I would also note that we have a representatives from the project owner here as well. Thank you. Uh, applicant? Good morning, Samantha Newmeyer with Ellison Schneider Harrison Donlin on behalf of the project owners. With me today is Barb McBride, also from uh, the project owners. We would like to thank staff for the couple of workshops that they held so that we could discuss the conditions of certification. We appreciate all of the work and um, collaborative nature of the efforts to um, make the conditions better. We support staff's recommendation and their revised conditions of certification, and we're here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any comments from anyone in the room? Anyone on the line? 
I think you have one party on, uh, actually one or three. This is for three. Okay. Uh, so let's go to full commission. Um, you know, I, I think the amendment's been described pretty well. I, I think I recommend it for the commission's approval. And if there are no questions, I'll go ahead and move approval. No second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. This item passed five to zero. Thank you. Let's go on to three. Uh, Warner Creek Energy. Good morning, Eric Verkamp again. I'm all. I'm also the project manager for the Walnut Creek Energy's petition requesting to modify conditions of certification, including air quality and worker safety, contained in the Walnut Creek Energy Park final decision. And with me this morning is Lisa DiCarlo, staff counsel, and Tao Zhang and Jeff Lesh of our engineering unit to respond to any questions as necessary. And we also have a representative of the project owner as well, Mr. George Bianca. The Walnut Creek Energy Park was licensed on February 27, 2008, and is a 500 megawatt simple cycle gas-fired peaking power plant located in the city of industry in Los Angeles County. On October 4th of 2017, Walnut Creek Energy submitted a petition to amend to modify the final decision for the Walnut Creek Energy Park for, for the Walnut Creek Energy Park. Walnut Creek Energy is requesting revisions to AQ4 for the ammonia emission limit and revisions to AQ7 to add clarifying language pertaining to particulates. Walnut Creek Energy is also requesting a change to Worker Safety 5 to remove outdated language related to training security guards in the use of emergency equipment. And I see that I printed, I, I have some additional information about the, the request to remove Worker Safety 5. Um, there are other measures that will require that two staff uh, at any given time are trained in the use of the emergency equipment. Uh, the defibrillator, to be specific, um, <clears throat> the, the, the facility does not employ security guards now, so that's why they're requesting to remove uh, the language specific to training the security guards. And I'm sorry I didn't have that language uh, in my printed version. The proposed modification to AQ7 is to remain in keeping with current technology practices, to address specific testing conditions, and overall to maintain consistency with the South Coast Air Quality Management District's Title V permit issued on September 28th of 2017. The petition stated that the intent of the proposed modification to AQ4 was to be consistent with emission standards for some older projects. However, staff finds the change to be inappropriate and is therefore proposing to reject it. The proposed modification to Worker Safety 5 is to address changing operational circumstances since the original license was approved. With no security guards in the employee of the facility, Walnut Creek Energy is unable to comply with the condition as written. The approved security plan does not require security guards, so the language change will bring about consistency between the plan and Worker Safety 5. The amended condition of certification still requires a minimum of two personnel per shift to be trained in the use of defibrillator. Staff is recommending rejecting the proposed revision to AQ4 as it would reduce the precision of the emission limit and potentially increase the limit by 0.5 parts per million by volume. The South Coast Air Quality Management District is also rejecting that request. Staff is recommending accepting the proposed revisions to AQ7 to conform to current testing protocols and current technology. Staff is also recommending accepting the proposed change to Worker Safety 5, eliminating the requirements for security guards to be trained in the use of the defibrillator. In response to the petition, staff has proposed a number of other changes to air quality conditions, including modified and or revised conditions, new conditions, and one deleted condition. The changes are necessary to update the Commission's decision to conform with changes made to the project's Title V air quality permit and are administrative in nature. Staff has concluded that the proposed change to the Walnut Creek Energy Park's final decision complies with the requirements of Title 20, se Section 1769A of the California Code of Regulations 
and recommends approval of the Walnut Creek Energy's request to modify conditions of certification. Staff concluded that the proposed language revisions will not result in any physical changes to the project, they will not have a, a significant effect on the environment, and will not affect the project's ability to continue to comply with applicable laws, ordinances, regulations, or standards with the adoption of the amended conditions of certification. The staff would be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Applicant? Good morning, Chair and uh, fellow commissioners. I'm George Pianca with NRG. I'm the Senior Director of Environmental, and I'm here representing uh, Walnut Creek uh, Energy LLC. On the phone, um, we have our uh, plant manager, Rick McPherson, and our environmental specialist, Heather McLeod. Uh, um, we, we as on behalf of the applicant, are, are comfortable with the analysis, have really no f you know, further comments. I just want to thank the staff for their work. This is really uh, an effort to um, catch up the license with the Title V, uh, a number of administrative changes that were put forth uh, with the Title V with South Coast AQMD, and this is the outcome of that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments from anyone in the room? Anyone on the phone? Well, I should see anyone other than the NRG representatives for the phone on the phone. Line is open. Okay, I think that that's transition to commissioners. Commissioner Douglas. Well, I've reviewed this material as well and recommend it for the commission's approval. We want to thank staff and the applicant for their work on this and the prior item. So I move approval of this item. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So this item also passes five to zero. Thank you. Let's go on to item four. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Mary Dias, and I'm the compliance project manager for the Kasumnas Power Plant. With me this morning is staff attorney Lisa DiCarlo, and technical staff is in attendance as well as representatives from the project. Today, staff is requesting approval of a petition to amend the commission final decision for the Kasumnas Power Plant. The proposed modifications will increase the capacity of the facility from 534 megawatts to 603 megawatts. The Kasumnas Power Plant is a 534 megawatt combined cycle natural gas facility located adjacent to the former Rancho Seco nuclear plant in southern Sacramento County. The project was certified by the Energy Commission on sep in September 2003 and began commercial operation in February of 2006. The project was licensed as a 1,000 megawatt project consisting of two power blocks of 500 megawatts each, and to date only one power block has been constructed. On January 8, 2018, staff approved the installation of advanced gas path upgrade components, installation of dry low oxides of nitrogen 2.6 combustors, and installation of oxygen catalyst system in the heat recovery steam generator. On August 29, 2018, the project owner, SMUD Municipal Utility District Financing Authority, filed a petition to amend with the Energy Commission requesting to operate the facility with the previously installed components. The petition proposes to increase electrical production from each of the two licensed combustion turbines, turbine generators, increase each combustion turbine's licensed fuel consumption, and increase air emission limits commensurate with the increased fuel consumption. The proposed modifications will increase the overall electrical output of the facility from 534 megawatts to 603 megawatts, which is within the electrical generation previously approved for the site. Staff reviewed the petition to amend and associated materials and determined that air quality is the only technical area requiring proposed new and revised conditions of certification in order to assure compliance with laws, ordinances, regulations, and standards, and to reduce potential environmental impacts to a less than significant level. Staff recommends restructuring and updating the air quality conditions of certification to include the addition of a description of the applicable equipment 
and the addition of three new conditions of certification, AQ5, AQ7, and AQ24. Additional changes include the deletion of duplicate and outdated conditions, amending conditions to incorporate the operational changes, including the resulting emission increases, and updating mitigation conditions of certification. One member of the public has submitted various comments on both the petition and on staff's analysis. On October 24, 2018, the Herald Fire Protection District submitted comments on the petition to amend. To the extent relevant, staff responded to comments in staff's November 8, 2018 analysis of the petition. Staff also responded to previous and additional comments in a separate response to comments document docketed on December 6, 2018. Further comments were received from the public on Friday, December 7, 2018 that repeat questions that staff addressed in their December 6 response to comments and I believe you have a copy of those before you. On December 3, 2018, the project owner provided comments on staff's analysis. Staff has reviewed the project owner's comments and concurs with the proposed condition changes with one exception to the requested language of AQ15AI. Staff recommended alternative language for this pr provision in its response to comments filed on December 6, 2018. Staff concludes that the changes proposed in this amendment and supplementary materials comply with the requirements of Title 20, Section 1769A of the California Code of Regulations and recommends approval of the project modifications and associated additions and revisions to, of the air quality conditions of certification. Thank you. And we're available if you have any questions. Great, thank you. Applicant? My name's Eric Pop. Good morning. My name is Eric Pop. I'm the manager for the thermal generation assets for SMUD. I'd like to introduce to my right Joe Schofield, who is our deputy general counsel for SMUD. And we just would like to take a moment to thank the uh, commission for this uh, time this morning to consider this project. We'd also like to uh, appreciate. Uh, the California Energy Commission staff for their thorough review and recommendation for approval. And we'd also like to recognize the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District staff for their thorough review of this project and their recommendation for approval. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start with public comment in the room. Let's start with uh, Fire Protection District. Please come up to the microphone and identify yourself for the court reporter. Hi, my name is uh, James Hendricks. I'm the fire chief for the Herald Fire Protection District. Is the microphone District. on? I believe yeah. it is. Good. And uh, at this point, we stand opposed to the project or would at least request a delay in the vote until we can work out a contract with SMUD to provide better fire protection for the facility. Um, we have had a problem with that facility since its construction, and uh, we continue to have a problem with fire protection at that facility. If you look at the paperwork that was filed in the past and currently, um, you'll find that the, the facility is only built to um, provide fire protection for two hours. In other words, use the fire sprinklers and 500 GPM out of, a, out of a fire hydrant that's located next to the plant. Um, and there's only one way in and one way out. Um, the uh, CO2 detection systems that provide the protection for the actual generators themselves, when they discharge, will discharge for 20 seconds, and they have provided a single person on site with seven hours of fire prevention training. So what we're looking at is 20 seconds worth of a discharge, two hours worth of, of 500 GPM gallon or fire protection, and uh, one person with seven hours worth of training, and one way in and one way out. Um, what we would like to do is work with SMUD and um, bring about a change to that um, to make sure that we can, uh, we can provide that better service in the future. Thank you. Let's, we have one other, we also have Mr. Yoler has comments. Let's get his comments and I'll ask applicant and staff to respond to you. Please have a seat for a second. Okay. Please come on up. Thank you, commissioners. Um, I've asked some questions of the staff 
and the responses uh, lead me to concern that the staff realizes that uh, you put IDs on power plants and uh, there is a supplemental supplement to the petition that lists some solar power plants that uh, I, uh, they have not identified those. Um, you have uh, Title 20, 1304 that requires them to report or whoever owns those plants to report the, the outputs of them. As a member of the public, I've already found out that your staff can decide to allow SMUD to not provide power content labels for voluntary products. I'm looking for any which way to find out this information. They haven't provided me with um, uh, uh, information on the solar plants or, in, or any of the other plants using your ID system. I see this as a major weakness and uh, throughout. I've actually assisted some of your staff to say, hey, your renewable net short is missing some renewables. And it's like, you must not have an inventory control system. So um, also, your staff doesn't think that I should know the qualifications of the legal staff who are making legal op opinions. I've asked about things related to uh, um, T norms, Te technologically enhanced uh, naturally occurring radioactive materials, uh, whether or not Sacramento County has the ability to identify those. Uh, the staff says that there is um, lead monitoring, but if you go to the site, it doesn't list it. Well, it turns out it, they only list real time there. And they don't look to see whether or not radioactive materials are caught in that. Now with uh, up at uh, Paradise, the EPA is running around with Geiger counters getting counts. I think we need to pay attention to what happens to uh, um, directionally drilled wells because these are all going into old seabeds and that's an area that this stuff builds up and, and if they start using uh, water to get that out, uh, we need to keep an eye on the, those type of items. So I'm opposed to this because uh, your staff, when I, well, I, I give them a picture, aerial view of hedge, and a typical way that somebody decides how much solar they can have is say, how much area? Because there's an uh, efficiency ratio. And, and it's like, uh, and I also give them one megawatt plant. They say it's a megawatt and a half. It's also a plant that uh, Kufer shows very little output on. So I pose this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's start with applicant. Do you have responses to either of the parties? Or to, hopefully you can respond to both the parties on this and then I'll ask staff for their comments. Well, um, to address the first, um, the Herald Fire Department's concerns, uh, read uh, his concerns and we went back and did a like, thorough review into our fire protection systems and uh, our review showed that we exceed all NFPA, National Fire Protection Association regulatory requirements. Not only do we meet them, we exceed them with all the systems, sprinkler systems, water storage facilities, fire hydrants. So we feel very confident in our current structure to fight a fire, uh, but we are more than happy to work with Herald Fire Department. Uh, we've had, uh, I believe, a very constructive uh, relationship in the past. We have annual uh, training exercises uh, where we'll do high angle rescues or man down type of exercises uh, to benefit both the site and Herald Fire Department. And we want to continue that relationship. So we value it and we want to continue working with Herald to make it the safest place. <coughs> As an additional comment, the concerns of the Herald Fire Department are not directly connected to the actual petition that's being proposed for a vote today, so we would oppose delaying the vote. Uh, would you please also comment on the public member, public intervener? I believe our comments were addressed in our written responses. I don't have anything more to add to that. Okay, thank you. Staff? Good morning, Lisa DiCarlo. Um, Energy Commission staff attorney. Uh, with regard to the uh, fire district's comments, uh, staff concluded with the original certification that the project would not result in any significant impact with regard to fire 
question that the uh, proposed project at the time complied with all laws uh, with regard to the petition in front of you. Currently, the staff concluded that the petition did not raise any new issues with regard to fire protection uh, that required additional analysis. So it did not trigger an, a, an additional review of the fire protection uh, issues. Uh, nevertheless, staff did address the fire department's comments in our analysis and concluded that uh, they are comfortable that the project uh, as modified with the proposed modification would not result in any significant impacts with regard to fire protection and would comply with all current laws. Uh, with regard to Mr. Euler's comments, uh, staff did respond to them both in our analysis. We incorporated his comments into our staff analysis and we also issued a separate uh, response to comments uh, specifically going item by item and addressing his comments. Uh, a lot of his comments do not relate directly to the proposed petition. They relate to uh, SMUD's compliance with other uh, requirements, uh, particularly the uh, power source disclosure regulations and, and some others. So to the extent that the comments raised issues that were not relevant to the petition, we uh, did not address those. But we did address all the relevant comments. Okay, thank you. Let's transition to commissioners. Commissioner Douglas. I guess I have uh, two main com well, well, first of all, um, I've reviewed the materials and I'm comfortable with them. I did want to hear what the commenters had to say today. And um, I do agree with um, staff and, and the applicant and SMUD that when, we, w when an applicant goes in for an amendment that's pertained to one portion of, an, of a license, um, it doesn't cause us to reopen the entire license. And, and yet I am glad to hear both SMUD and, the app and, and staff say that nevertheless, they, <laughs> they took a second look at the fire protection um, requirements and um, that SMUD is, is ready to continue talking to the fire district because that's obviously important and, and you know licenses are granted and time passes and, and standards get better. And um, the fact that we don't use necessarily every amendment to relook at the entire license and make everything better, you know, doesn't mean that we don't want people to always strive for the best safety and, and operational um, efficiency and parameters and notification and all of that that, that they can. So, um, you know, I listened with some interest to Mr. Euler's comments, they, they do seem to pertain to some broader issues around power source disclosure or around other items rather than the um, specifics of the amendment before us. Um, but I wanted to ask staff, to the extent that in the comments they did address the amendment um, before us, you, you've said that you responded in obviously both the response to comments and a separate response to comments. Wh what would you say are some of the comments that, that did more specifically respond to the amendment? I, I'm particularly, you know, just want to double check that those were responded to, you know, with the necessary thoroughness. Certainly, and we do have staff here uh, mm -hmm. to provide more detail if, uh, if okay. the commissioners want it. Um, one of the concerns he had was with regard to the hedge uh, solar facility mm -hmm. that I believe is on the site or nearby. He was concerned about the, uh, the exact uh, production of that facility, how many megawatts it actually produces. Um, and uh, we can't necessarily pin that down exactly, right. but we know enough about its production to know um, that the transmission system can accommodate the revision proposed in the petition. Got it. Um, knowing that that plant is producing. Okay. Um, so to the extent it affected the analysis, we, uh, we had the information we needed Got on it. that. Uh, he was concerned that we didn't identify it by its ID number, but we traditionally do not do that in analyses for siting projects. We mm -hmm. identify them by their name and location. Okay. Um, he also raised some concerns about um, uh, T norms and lead content of the natural gas that's going to be used um, and uh, 
uh, Nancy Fletcher, our air quality analyst, is here to respond to that. Uh, but we, we concluded that, that there aren't any significant um, issues with regard to that. I mean, it's okay. natural gas. It's the same issues associated with all natural gas facilities. And we analyzed that and concluded there were no significant impacts and all the laws were being complied with. All right. Well, those responses are, are helpful, and I, I want to see if there are any other questions, and it um, doesn't look like it. Um, so I'll, I'll move this item for approval. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 This item passes 5 to 0. Thank you. Let's go on to item 5. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Mary Dias, and I'm the Compliance Project Manager for the Stanton Energy Reliability Center Request for Qualifications. Today, staff is seeking approval of the proposed resolution approving an agreement with NV5 for a zero-sum contract with the Energy Commission to provide delegate chief building official services for the Stanton Energy Reliability Center. If approved, NV5 will enter into a separate agreement with W Power, the project owner, for payment. The Energy Commission is the chief building official for all power plants under the Energy Commission's jurisdiction and is authorized to designate a delegate chief building official to assist with Energy Commission's chief building official responsibilities. To delegate this authority, the Energy Commission released a request for qualifications to select the most qualified firm to provide delegate chief building official services for the Stanton Energy Reliability Center. Through this process, three firms provided bids and NV5 received the highest score through a competitive bid process. The Energy Commission has also established hourly rates through a rate negotiation process. If the agreement is approved, NV5 and W Power will negotiate a separate contract for payment with the rates that staff has established in our agreement with NV5. The Energy Commission will be named as a third-party beneficiary to the agreement to ensure enforcement rights by the Energy Commission. At this time, staff is requesting approval of the contract and the assignment of NV5 as the Delegate Chief Building Official for the Stanton Energy Reliability Center. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any comments from anyone in the room? Anyone on the phone? Then let's transition to Commissioner Douglas. Move approval of this item. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 This passes 5 to 0. Thank you. Let's go on to item 6. Alana, we're on item six. <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm here to provide an update on a new representative from the, dis the SB 350 Disadvantage Advisory Group. And a new representative has been appointed by the governor's office, tribal liaison. It is Ms. Jana Ganyan. She is the energy director for the Blue Lake Rancheria, where she helped establish the tribe's energy strategy and develop projects in energy efficiency, renewable energy, green fuels, and community resiliency, including biomass, biodiesel, electric vehicle infrastructure, and her latest project is a combination of distributed gener generation solar, grid battery storage, and microgrid. Ms. Ganyan currently serves on the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Energy Indian Energy, Indian Country, Energy and Infrastructure Working Group. Any questions? Just a comment. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with Jana for years now, and she's really thoughtful and really knowledgeable and exercises a lot of leadership in the area of uh, tribal energy um, initiatives more generally. So I'm pretty excited to have her um, working on this as part of the task force and I think she'll really be able to help out. Great. Any <coughs> public comment from anyone in the room? 
anyone on the line? Okay. I might, I might just add to uh, Commissioner Douglas's remarks. Um, also very excited. We have a, a terrific level of expertise on our disadvantage advisory group, and uh, to be able to add Ms. Gagnon to this is, is uh, very exciting, so I'm looking forward to working with her as well. Great, so uh, I'll move, is this a vote? Oh, it's just informational, okay, great. Great, so let's go on to item seven. Good morning, Chair Weisenmiller and Commissioners. My name is Joseph Omoletsky and I'm representing the Renewable Energy Division. I am one of the technical staff that works on maintaining the Energy Commission's list of solar equipment. Uh, with me in the room also is Staff Counsel Mona Batty, as well as Division staff and management if you have any questions. I'm here to ask for your support to approve the adoption of the guidelines for California Solar Electric Incentive Programs, 7th edition. The substantive changes made in this edition of the guidelines includes the addition to equipment standards and testing requirements to address CPUC Rule 21 Smart Inverter Phase 2 and Phase 3 requirements, current PV module safety standards, and optional PV module performance and design qualification standards. This update also adds energy storage safety requirements as well as makes revisions to the process to delist obsolete and unsupported equipment. These changes update the guidelines to align the list with current industry practices and the current solar market. Senate Bill 1 established the California Solar Initiative and with it, it tasked the Energy Commission with establishing general incentive program criteria as well as equipment rating standards. The lists were created in part to meet that requirement of developing rating standards. Over the past decade, the lists have grown to over 20,000 PV modules and over 3,000 inverters. The lists are used by incentive programs throughout California as well as in many states throughout the country. The lists also assist with the streamlined processing of interconnection applications for the investor-owned utilities. And finally, it serves as a single information source for many parties, including utilities, companies, designers, and general members of the public. Some of the recent accomplishments for the list of solar equipment include supporting the initial phase one smart inverter requirements to ensure the continued streamlined processing of interconnection applications, incorporating modifications that were made to those phase one requirements to ensure that the list continues to serve as a central information source. And finally, staff have established working relationships with investor owned utilities, publicly owned utilities, manufacturers, labs, and trade groups to ensure that we are fully engaged with industry. These draft guidelines were developed with thorough public input and staff went through multiple revisions to ensure that all of the public comment was incorporated. Staff held two separate workshops, one a lead commissioner workshop on August 16th and a draft guidelines workshop on October 19th. Public comment periods were provided after each of these workshops. Staff held meetings and conference calls with different commenters and partners, including labs, trade groups, utilities, and manufacturers, to ensure that all of their concerns and comments were incorporated and addressed. Finally, staff have remained coordinated with CPUC and have participated in CPUC-led working groups to ensure alignment between the two agencies. Staff requests your approval to adopt the seventh edition of the Guidelines for California Solar Electric Incentive Programs. Your approval of this update to the guidelines will ensure the Energy Commission's list of solar equipment remain the definitive resource for industry. First, the list can continue to support smart inverter requirements, including those that are scheduled to go into effect early next year. Second, the list can assist the successful implementation of the 2019 Building Energy Efficiency Standards, and our division staff remain in uh, collaboration with the Efficiency Division staff on that. Third, the list will provide much needed information regarding energy storage. Staff will continue to work with utilities, industry, and labs on all future list developments. 
Thank you for your time and consideration, and I am available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments from anyone in the room? Anyone on the line? Okay. okay. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Joseph, and the whole team. Uh, I would just note that uh, next month we expect to hit one million solar roofs in California, and the the list uh, has played an absolutely essential role in keeping uh, shoddy, dangerous equipment off the market, and that's why it's used so widely uh, around the United States. And uh, it's a real tribute, I think, to trying to get out in front of some of the issues, particularly around fire and so forth. So I think it's been very successful and look forward to uh, continued success and uh, thank the team for, for doing a good job managing it. Unless there's other comments, I would move the item. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So this passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go on to item eight. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Patrick Saxton, and I'm an engineer in the Appliances Office in the Commission's Efficiency Division. With me is Matt Chalmers from the Chief Counsel's Office. Staff is proposing the adoption of a resolution encompassing two items related to amending the California Appliance Efficiency Regulations. The two items are, one, a proposed negative declaration under the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, and two, proposed regulatory language that incorporates a minimum efficiency performance standard and certification requirements for portable air conditioners. I have a short presentation related to this item. Staff evaluated this project under CEQA and determined the proposed efficiency standard will reduce future electricity consumption and the criteria pollutants and other particulates that result from fossil fuel generated electricity. The standard will not result in significant changes to the way portable air conditioners are manufactured or the materials used to produce them. Staff made a finding of no significant adverse effect on the environment for this project. No comments were received during the 30-day public comment period. The proposed efficiency standard leverages work initially completed by the U.S. Department of Energy, or DOE. DOE completed their entire analysis and pre-published a final rule on December 28, 2016. Because the DOE final rule was never implemented, there is no preemption and California is free to implement state efficiency standards for portable air conditioners. The images on this slide represent the types of products covered, specifically single and dual duct portable air conditioners that attach to an adjustable window bracket. The scope of the proposed standard excludes spot air conditioners, such as the ones shown on this slide. Spot air conditioners either have no ducts or have ducts that do not attach to an adjustable window bracket. The Energy Commission has existing test and list requirements for spot air conditioners. And the proposed regulations do not make any change to those requirements. This chart represents the mathematical formula for the proposed minimum efficiency standard for portable air conditioners. Portable air conditioners would be required to achieve a minimum combined energy efficiency ratio, or CEER, which is depicted on the vertical axis, for a given seasonal adjusted cooling capacity, or SACC, which is depicted on the horizontal axis. The solid blue curve at the bottom represents the baseline current market average efficiency of portable air conditioners. The dashed green curve at the top represents the maximum technically feasible efficiency level, EL4. The standard is proposed at efficiency level 2, which is the same as DOE's pre-publication final rule. <coughs> EL2 represents the efficiency level where DOE determined the ratio of measured CEER to nominal CEER corresponds to the maximum available efficiency across a full range of portable air conditioner cooling capacities. EL2 represents a middle ground between the existing market 
and the maximum level of technical feasibility. The proposed performance standard is technically feasible and manufacturers have multiple pathways to improve their products. Some of those are increasing the size of the heat exchanger, using a more efficient compressor or fan motor, or reducing standby power. The DOE estimated that 13% of portable air conditioner models meet efficiency level two. This estimate was published in December 2016 and based on analysis mostly performed in 2015. The proposed standards have a benefit cost ratio of 2.95 to one. Note that the estimated incremental retail price of $76 includes both markup and profit. On a per unit basis, the standard is estimated to save 2,230 kilowatt hours and $224 over the 10 year life of the product. On a statewide basis, the standard is estimated to annually save 369 gigawatt hours and $49.7 million after all portable air conditioners have been replaced with more efficient units required by the standard. During the 45 day public comment period, three comments were received. Two comments support the efficiency standard. One comment opposes the February 1, 2020 effective date, but does not oppose the underlying standard. Staff also held a public hearing pursuant to the California Administrative Procedure Act. No new comments were received at the hearing. At least one commissioner has received an additional letter from a manufacturer opposing the effective date. Staff finds that the proposed standard is technically feasible and cost effective, thus meeting the statutory requirements for appliance efficiency regulations in the Warren Alquist Act. Staff requests that the commission adopt the resolution before them to approve the negative declaration and to amend the California appliance efficiency regulations. Matt and I are available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. So let's take public comment. We'll start with public comment from those in the room. Star Faham. Good morning, I'm Rosemary and I work with the Energy Commission Public Advisor's Office yes. and I'm going to read a comment for um, Mr. Alberto Aloisi. Yeah, uh, wait, why don't you wait until I call him? I called a him first. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. fine, just sit down for a second. Please, come forward. Thank you, good morning. Uh, Kevin Messner with the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers. Um, I'll just uh, speak today about the effective date because the cost and the energy analysis really doesn't matter because the effective date's completely unrealistic. Um, just uh, in order to meet this energy standard, by and large, the efficiency has to do with airflow. There's a major redesigns that have to happen for this product probably going to have to be bigger for the airflow. That's just putting one example that might ring true. The stamping or the extruding for the casing, all the tooling that you need to do, all the redesign, all the durability, safety testing, the prototype evaluation, just the basic mechanics of designing and manufacturing a new product, it just cannot happen in one year. It just can't. And so I don't know where this date came from. Vermont has a date of 2022. Washington State proposed the other week 2022. We had negotiated 2022 in Vermont. 2020, just there's just you can't manufacture redesign a product in a year. So there's only 13% of the products out there. This is a significant standard change. I don't know to tell you all that you're gonna where this came from and and if if this if you proceed with this date where that'll end up. Um, DOE has a five-year lead-in period, so all the analysis that's based on what DOE did in cost and design is based on a five-year lead-in period for manufacturers, not one year. So the analysis uses DOE technical support document assumes five years, not one year. No, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it, the, it's this square peg in a round hole where you rely on DOE analysis for five years but then do an effective date of one year. Um, I also want to last point just for the record state that on preemption 
see the state of California has argued this is in the courts, and we want to be on the record. We all, we want DOE to publish the PAC standard. We have been trying to do that. Obviously, it hasn't happened yet. But it's in the courts. They just heard oral arguments. The state of California has argued in the courts that this standard has been issued. And under EPCA law, if DOE issues a standard, then it preempts the states. So I just wanted to say that for the record. So this is very troublesome, but it's, it's so, this effective date is so quick and so unreal, unrealistic. Just wanted, we've said this since the beginning of this process. I really honestly don't know where the 2020 came from. But uh, thank you, my time's up. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else in the room of public comment? Public advisor, please. Yes, I'm oh, Rosemary. Oh. Again, we're really first taking comments from those in the room, and then we'll go to the line. So go ahead. Yes, I'm Rosemary Avalos with the Energy Commission Public Advisor's Office, and I'm going to provide public comment on behalf of Mr. Alberto Aloisi of the DeLonghi Appliances Group. Uh, DeLonghi re respectfully submits the following comments to the California Energy Commission. DeLonghi is a manufacturer of household appliances which has been producing portable air conditioners for more than 25 years and we support a reasonable efficiency regulations for portable air conditioners. Nevertheless, we believe that the proposed effective date February 2020 is absolutely unrealistic as most of the PACs actually on the market do not fulfill the proposed requirements and manufacturers do not have enough time to redesign, retool, retest according to the new procedure and new standards for all the PAC models they offer for sale in California. We ask the CEC to wait for the publication of the DOE standard or at least to postpone the effective date to 2022. DeLongai appreciates the opportunity to submit these comments to CEC and would be glad to discuss these matters in more detail on your request. Thank you. Thank you. So now let's go to comments on the phone. Uh, let's start out with GE. that are, you know, there's a complete redesign of the products, there's retooling, but also the laboratories for testing is very limited at this point. Uh, and to, for all of the industry to have to do a redesign, and retest, what's really less than one year, because I, I think what's important to remember is production for this product starts September of October of the year prior to, uh, you know, the seasonal year. So really we're looking at nine months for, you know, redesign, retooling, and demonstration of compliance. So uh, again, I would ask that we push the effective date out. Thank you. Let's go on to Medea American, or America. With uh, Medea America Corporation, I'm um, an engineer and regulatory manager for Medea. Our uh, company uh, represents uh, about uh, a significant market share in portable air conditioners in the U.S. market. And on behalf of Medea America, uh, we agree with uh, General Electric, uh, DeLonghi, and AHAM vehemently opposing uh, this legislation. Under normal circumstances, manufacturers have five years to comply to the new standard once it's uh, imposed and finalized by the Department of Energy. In this particular case, uh, CEC is attempting to short circuit this normal process. Um, we, we do propose that the standard uh, not be applied until 2022, giving us a time uh, in the design cycle to ensure that all of our products uh, can meet the standard uh, in a, a normal, an adequate amount of time. Uh, to give you an example of the normal design cycle, uh, 
designs for 2020 uh, would require to be uh, finalized uh, two years prior to uh, the actual manufacturing date. Um, and uh, up to 18 months, uh, we're going through pre-manufacturing and prototyping. And that, that process can take uh, anywhere from uh, three months out to a full year. In the case of this uh, particular uh, standard, uh, there are vast differences between what is uh, required today uh, versus um, uh, this new standard effectiveness. Um, requiring a complete redesign of the products. Um, uh, we depend on this time in order to, to be in full compliance, and we uh, ask the panel to uh, consider, uh, um, you know, future consumers in California uh, to, to have this product available in California. It's very important to make sure that uh, we have the time to, to make these design changes and go into full production. You need to understand that full production uh, begins in October uh, of the year uh, prior. So October of next year, we would begin, uh, we would begin, begin production for, uh, for this, uh, this particular platform. Um, the gentleman that uh, spoke earlier uh, suggested that standby power uh, could be applied and, uh, and, and if, uh, more energy efficient uh, condenser. In this particular case, standby power represents an, only a very small fraction of the total energy consumed by a portable air conditioner. This study and an analysis is completely inaccurate. Um, and it's inaccurate about uh, uh, energy efficient condenser as well. Uh, that's all. I thank you very much for the uh, time today to consider my uh, suggestion. Okay. Thank you. LG? and environmental affairs at LG Electronics. LG understands CSE's uh, efforts to pursue energy efficiency improvements for California residents and supports uh, its efforts to harmonize with federal regulations. However, we have one concern about CSE's propose, proposed effective date of uh, February 1st, 2020. Uh, for newly covered pro uh, products, uh, federal law requires that <clears throat> newly established uh, federal energy co uh, convert, uh, conservation standards does not <clears throat> uh, not apply to uh, like products manufactured within five years after the public uh, publication date of the final rule, and we have a similar experience related to like uh, BCS regulations. BCS is a uh, battery charging system. And back to 2012, uh, DOE didn't have like a regulation for BCS, and however, uh, CEC had. And at that time, our robotic vacuum cleaner didn't meet uh, BCS regulations. So at that time, like we, we couldn't have enough time to <clears throat> develop our product in order to meet like uh, CEC's uh, requirements. So at that point, uh, we requested our retailers not to sell in California. Uh, and then like in a couple of years, uh, finally we developed our product uh, to meet uh, to met, like uh, regulations, uh, CC uh, requirements at the time, like we, we sold the product. So my uh, our point is uh, we do not wanna uh, give like any uh, uh, bad impact for uh, California customers. So please consider aligning the like, effective date with federal regulations for California customers. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, energy solutions? And uh, this is a California regulation. The Energy Commission has full legal authority to be regulating portable ACs. For CEC to do so, they require only a one-year lead time 
So I will repeat, this is a CEC regulation, a California Energy Commission regulation, not a DOE regulation, uh, and only one year is required. Uh, to this point, I'll also note that DOE did release the determination for standards in 2013. They held a public meeting in 2015 and their final rule in 2016. So it is not true that everything is starting from the beginning, that everything is starting now, that they need a lot more time to do this. While they had noticed, noticed since 2013 that regulations for these products were coming. Uh, the Energy Commission proposes Efficiency Level 2, uh, which uh, the, the California IOUs believe is quite conservative. Uh, DOE had indicated that Efficiency Level 2 already exists across all cooling capacities. Uh, so there are products available that uh, can meet this Efficiency Level requirement uh, across all cooling capacities already. Uh, so uh, claims that uh, total manufacturing uh, uh, redone, redoing needs to be uh, taken place is, is greatly exaggerated. Uh, the Energy Commission pointed out also that 13 uh, percent of, of portable ACs already meet this requirement. Uh, we believe that the sales will indicate that even greater percentage already meets this requirement. Uh, California should continue to be leaders uh, in, in, in the regulatory space. They should continue uh, to be pushing for more efficient uh, products. Uh, and the last point that I will uh, make here, uh, even at efficiency level two, uh, portable ACs are less efficient than their uh, window room AC counterparts. Uh, so even at this efficiency level, uh, while there are great savings, uh, this is not asking for any new technology that needs any major manufacturing changes the technology already exists in, in window, room air conditioners. Uh, it is already being sold uh, widely. California should continue to adopt this as it is legally authorized to do, uh, giving one year's notice uh, before the effective date of the standard. Thank you. Uh, staff, do you have any concluding remarks? Thank you. I would just uh, also note that um, the Department of Energy's statutory requirements come from the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, or EPCA, and indeed that's true, that there's a five-year phase-in period for a new standard. Of course, the Energy Commission's statutory requirements come from the Warren Alquist Act, and that's one year for California. Um, staff has found these proposed standards to be technically feasible and cost-effective to the end user over the lifetime of the appliance. And um, there are products available which do meet the efficiency standard. There's no requirement, nor is it typical practice to allow enough time for all of the products from all of the manufacturers to be modified to meet a proposed standard. Thank you. Thank you. So let's transition to commissioners. Commissioner McAllister. Yeah, so. Um, Let's see. Uh, I have uh, actually been uh, quite involved in this um, uh, sort of last piece of this before uh, bringing it to the business meeting. And, you know, I think we've heard the, the sort of technical situation. I don't disagree with that. Uh, and certainly, I think uh, our statutory um, responsibility and, and um, authority here is clear. Um, you know, the, the, let's see. Our process is a great process. We've seen it over and over again, that when we get good engagement from industry, when we get um, you know, forthcoming uh, uh, industry members that bring data, that bring you know, information about their supply chain and their design criteria, and certainly uh, market share and, and sort of more market uh, information, you know, we absolutely have the ability to keep that private. We do that routinely. Um, and the process has been there all along for industry to participate in. And, um, and again, you know, I'll just uh, reiterate what, um, what uh, Mr. Saxon said, that uh, you know, we, we have dug into this uh, deeply. I think many of the points uh, that have been made, um, the last commenter from, uh, the on behalf of the IOUs uh, made some good points there as well. 
you know, um, it's a, I really want to make this a bit of a wake-up call for industry to participate all along in this process and not just come sort of um, to say, oh gosh, now we can't do it. This has been, the writing's been on the wall for a long time. Um, you know, some of you will remember, or you'll all remember the adoption of, uh, you know, the computer and monitor standards, uh, certainly the building standards that we just uh, finished, you know, a robust participation from industry members that ended up in a supportive uh, position with respect to those, uh, those regulations. Um, so I hope, I, I would have hoped that uh, we would have a similar uh, dynamic in this, uh, uh, in, in this process for these regulations. Um, and so, uh, you know, a year is not a huge amount of time, but the marketplace is going to have to adjust. And um, we have products that meet it now. Uh, and I would, you know, exhort the manufacturers who came on the line to, uh, you know, move as quickly as they can uh, to offer uh, complying um, products to the California marketplace uh, in, in the time frame that they are able as quickly as possible. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, what other states have done or certainly what the Feds have done, we need to get ahead of this. We don't want to wait, actually. We would want to wait for DOE to uh, publish their rule because then we would have no savings for five years. Um, and it, it might be imminent. Nobody knows exactly when DOE is going to publish officially, but um, we need to get ahead of that and go ahead and get a regulation in place so we can uh, move the marketplace as we know it is going to be moved at some point anyway. Um, I had uh, some conversations, you know, with industry uh, members uh, about this and, um, you know, looked at our various options, but I think uh, our, our most straightforward, clearest option that both acts within our authority and moves the markets so in the direction that we need to in the time frame that we need is to go ahead and adopt today. Uh, so um, if, um, you know, there's no, no reason why we have to align with Vermont uh, or any other state. Um, you know, the negotiations there, don't, we were not party and, we, and they're not, they're not uh, um, on the record here. Um, so I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of this, uh, certainly willing to work with manufacturers in any future proceeding to uh, get better comp uh, sort of uh, participation and, uh, and, and get an outcome that incorporates uh, real data from the marketplace. So uh, anyway, I'm supportive of this and would move to adopt. Excuse me, I would like to make a comment. I we switched over to the commissioners, so I don't want you to make a comment. Otherwise, other people can respond to him, and that's not appropriate. So please wait till the public comment later. Um, I'm just trying to understand how how would I rebut what he's just said? No, I'm just saying we. I said we transition to the commissioners, which means we'll st we stop public comment at that point. So let's. But you haven't acted yet, so yeah. the public doesn't get this piece of information that the commissioner just gave. By the way, I'm Steve Euler, UHLER. Yes, Steve Euler, exactly. Well, go ahead. But again, normal policy is once we transition, that's it. Certainly, you're welcome all the way up to that point. Okay. Um, I'd like to note a couple things about the appliance efficiency as far as a consumer and as far as trying to find accurate information. Your database still holds inaccurate information that I have notified multiple times to the Commission. There are situations with things like battery chargers where if you do the numbers, it's physically impossible. Somebody has turned in numbers and you've accepted it. You have refrigerators that have style types that are not in your regulation. So to say this is, a, this is another inventory control issue. I'm an inventory control guy and I look at this stuff and I try to add things up and I try to pick things out. You, you uh, modernize the database and it's, Try to use it on your phone while you're shopping. You've done a number of things that, that really, uh, uh, I don't think, help uh, in the situation. I, I see this. If these folks need this additional time to do this, uh, um, I think you should allow it. Because you should also clean up your database. Because you have items in there that are, that are not real. And if you look them up you, and you go and buy them, you find out they don't perform that way. So please look at, take that aspect uh, when you think about that you can do this in a year, but you're not required to do it in a year. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's go on. Do I have a second for this? I second the motion. 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes five to zero. Thank you. Thanks, Thank staff. You. Let's go on to item nine. My name is Payam Bodukchani. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Payam Bodukchami of the Building Standards Office, Project Manager for the Development of the 2019 Compliance Manuals. <coughs> State law requires the Energy Commission to create compliance manuals and compliance documents for the for its building energy efficiency standards. The manuals are designed to help owners, designers, builders, inspectors, plan examiners, and energy consultants to comply with and enforce the California's energy efficiency standards for both residential and non-residential buildings. Written as both references and doc, uh, instru excuse me, instru in, instru excuse me, instructional guides, these manuals assist any, anyone directly or indirectly involved in the design and construction of the energy efficiency building. On May 9th, the Energy Commission adopted the 2019 Building Energy Efficiency Standards, and on December 5th, the California Building Standards Commission approved the adopted standards for inclusion into the California Building Codes. Proceeding under direction from the commissioners to simplify both standards and supporting documents, staff worked with the codes and standards enhancement team, including the California publicly owned and investor owned utilities, to update the residential and non residential compliance manuals, the compliance documents, and the data register requirement manuals to reflect the changes to the standards that were adopted for 2019. We further simplified the compliance documents by developing dynamic forms and providing further instructions to users on completing the documents more effectively. We also clarified instructions to home energy rating system providers in the data registry requirement manual on how to register product data and documentation to demonstrate compliance with the standards. The residential and non-residential compliance manuals and the data registry requirement manual were posted for a 30-day public comment period on the Energy Commission website. Staff received several comments and worked diligently to update information and incorporate suggestions where appropriate in order to provide the final manuals and documentation to you today for approval. Staff therefore asks and recommends that you approve the 2019 compliance manuals and documents. I am available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. So let's start. Any comments from anyone in the room? Anyone on the line? I believe we have one. Please, Mr. Keene. No, sorry, no comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, no further comment. Let's transition to Commissioner McAllister again. Uh, so, thanks, Payam. I appreciate that. Um, you know, as you uh, as you know, the the uh, new uh, standards for 2020 were approved by the Building Standards Commission last week. You know, I think we're all waving the flag on that still. It was a good, uh, it was a great conversation actually with the commission. I really appreciated Secretary Badger's uh, marshalling of that conversation, sort of uh, you know guiding that conversation amongst our commissioners and um, uh, the comments by the commissioners themselves over there were uh, I think were instructive and, and very positive. Uh, so this is really now we're in, in you know we've uh, attempting to you know to anticipate that vote. We've uh, staff has been working hard on the compliance materials, so I uh, really appreciate you getting those done so that the marketplace can have uh, sufficient time to to begin to adjust and uh, and understand the new standards and uh, implement them when the time comes on January one of twenty twenty. So um, I think that's uh, that's the high level. So it's an important step forward to really get them uh, you know get the rubber on the road with the new standards in twenty twenty. So with that, I'll uh, move this item. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's past five to zero. Thank you. Let's go on to item 10. Good 
morning, uh, Chair Weisenmiller and Commissioners. I'm Ingrid Neumann with the Building Standards Office, and I'm bringing the City of Arcata's request for approval of a new building I'm energy sorry, ordinance. You need to get closer to okay, before you today. With me is Jacqueline Moore from the Chief Counsel Office. Our office encourages and assists local jurisdictions in developing and adopting local energy standards that go beyond the statewide standards adopted by the Commission. Today's ordinance will be the 20th we've brought to the Commission under the 2016 Building Energy Efficiency Standards. Local governmental agencies wishing to enforce locally adopted energy standards must by statute apply to the Energy Commission for a finding that the local energy standards require buildings to obtain equal or greater energy efficiency than the current energy standards. Staff reviewed the City of Arcata's application and finds that its ordinance meets the requirements for consideration by the Commission. The City of Arcata's ordinance requires all new single family construction to use only 70% of the energy budget permitted for compliance with the 2016 Building Energy Efficiency Standards. This meets the 2016 Cal Green Tier 2 target, and then all new low rise multifamily buildings shall use only 80% of the energy budgets permitted for compliance with the 2016 energy standards. The City of Arcata staff found that the ordinance is cost effective and has no significant negative impact on the environment. For these reasons, staff recommends that the findings be approved and the Energy Commission resolution be signed. I'm available to answer any questions you may have, as is Julie Neander on the phone from the City of Arcata. Great, so first, any comments from anyone in the room? Okay, so let's go to the line. Neander, I'm the City of Arcata Environmental Program Manager. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that we were available for comments. Uh, Arcata is very supportive of adopting this REACH code. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner McAllister. Great. I want to just uh, thank the representative from Arcata for bringing this forward to us, uh, and staff for evaluating it. Uh, again, I think this is number 20. Uh, for uh, local governments that are going beyond the 2016 code. It's a, a really positive, uh, I think, uh, dynamic we have now with local governments where uh, you know they really are trying to do the right thing and uh, working with us to, to get there in a way that makes sense. Um, Narcata, you know, way up, there, way up there at the northern end of our state from all the way down to the southern end of our state, we have local governments who are, who are taking this and similar approaches. So really uh, supportive and, and uh, thankful that uh, you all roll up your sleeves and get this done at the local level and doing it in a way that responds well to the needs of your community. Uh, so I'm, I'm obviously very uh, supportive, and uh, it's a really great transition into the new 2019 code when it comes around. So uh, thanks for getting ahead of the game. All right, so I will move this item. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. This item passes 5 to 0. Thank you. Let's go into 11. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Sebastian Sarad, and I'm with the Fuels and Transportation Division. For the record, the December 10th, 2018 business meeting agenda has been updated to correct the address on item 11A to 2051 West 190th Street, Torrance, California, 90501. I'm presenting a grant agreement for possible approval that will provide operation maintenance funding for a hydrogen refueling station. In August 2017, the Alternative and Renewable Fuel and Vehicle Technology Program released the first come, first served, light duty vehicle hydrogen refueling infrastructure operation maintenance support grants. The purpose of this solicitation is to provide funding to ensure that the hydrogen refueling stations remain operating during the rollout of fuel cell electric vehicles. This solicitation funds the proposed grant agreement. The grant agreement being proposed today is for a hydrogen refueling station located in Torrance. This agreement will require the station operator to report many details of the station operation and maintenance. The reports are according to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's data collection tool. 
rent, electricity consumption, equipment, station and maintenance, the amount of fuel dispensed, the day and the time of day the fuel is dispensed, hydrogen gas deliveries for three years are reported. The Energy Commission aggregates the data with that of other hydrogen refueling stations in the network and reports this to the California Legislature annually. Thank you for your consideration of this item. I have, if you have any questions, I feel I can answer those. Thank you. Let's start with any comments from anyone in the room. Let's go to the line in. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, good morning, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak via telephone today. I'm Wayne Leedy, Hydrogen Business Development Manager for Shell, responsible for our activities in hydrogen mobility in North America. We are grateful to the California Energy Commission for your consideration of this proposed grant funding, which will support operation and maintenance of the Shell Hydrogen Refueling Station in Torrance. Customer adoption of hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles and demand for the hydrogen fuel in California is growing. For a bit of context, this single shell hydrogen refueling station in Torrance provided approximately the same amount of hydrogen fuel to customers in 2018 as all the hydrogen refueling stations in Germany combined, where the 50th station was recently opened. This station has averaged over 85% utilization through August with a peak month at 97%. The Demand shows both the opportunity and the need for expanding the coverage and capacity of the hydrogen refueling network, and we appreciate the continued support from the California Energy Commission in that endeavor. It also shows the importance of reliability in station equipment running near full capacity. The experience from this and other existing hydrogen refueling stations serving customers at near capacity with the data collection and, re and reporting under the proposed O&M grant funding that was mentioned will help create the next generation of station equipment products. Shell is today investing in lower carbon fuels and diversifying the range of energy choices we provide to customers. Hydrogen is one of these options and we believe it can play an important role in the future transport sector. We're grateful to the Energy Commission for consideration of grant funding to overcome the early market barriers. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Scott? Great. Thank you, Wayne, for uh, joining us by phone today. Um, I don't have anything to add to um, Wayne's comments or uh, Sebastian's excellent presentation. So if no questions. I will move approval of item 11. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 This passes 5 to 0. Thank you. Uh, let's go on to item 12. <coughs> Good morning, Chair Weisenmiller and Commissioners. My name is Benson Gilbert, and I'm with the Energy Research and Development Division. I'm here today to recommend approval of a grant for CalCEF Ventures for approximately $11 million to establish and manage a voucher program that will provide clean energy companies with access to a statewide network of eligible testing facilities that will support California clean energy companies in vetting out and or certifying their technologies. Clean energy companies face the difficult challenge of making the leap from prototype to pilot scale demonstration to commercialization of their technologies because they lack access to testing facilities and services to validate or certify their products design, safety, and performance. They also lack technical feedback to shift their products specifications to meet the requirements of potential customers. Helping clean energy companies successfully overcome these challenges will increase the likelihood that their innovations will reach the market, thus helping California achieve its ambitious energy goals. CalCEF will develop and implement a voucher program that will provide clean energy companies access to testing facilities to test and or certify prototypes of pre-commercial distributed energy resource technologies and help them refine their prototype to meet customer specifications. This project will start with an initial network of testing facilities that includes 29 University of California facilities 
from all 10 campuses and two national laboratory facilities. CalCEF intends to grow this network throughout the duration of the project. This network of testing facilities will connect testing facilities throughout, uh, the, throughout California, which would otherwise remain disconnected. In order to serve clean energy companies more efficiently and effectively throughout all of California. Thank you for your time. I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Is there any comments from anyone in the room? Please. Thank you, Chairman Weissmuller and the commissioners and Gilbert and the staff who've helped prepare this. My name is Danny Kennedy. I'm the managing director of the California Clean Energy Fund. And we're very excited to be here today um, on the cusp of the sort of NOPA being uh, approved to move forward. Um, and I want to say that on behalf of our partners in this proposal as well, who are the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator that you know well as one of the clusters in the California energy innovation ecosystem. And also, and more importantly, I think the UC Office of the President. So the, the great piece about this um, initiative, I think, is that we're going to engage that giant in the scene at the University of California through the Office of the President to all the campuses and all the labs to be part of this solution in terms of getting our clean tech entrepreneurs to market through this kind of valley of death that we've actually seen getting worse in the market over the last number of years because um, the stage from prototype to pilot or beyond is something that the venture capitalists and others are less willing to fund these days and, and take the risk out with their own capital. And so many companies have been getting good products prototyped and then not being able to, to last the distance. And so the theory of this is that we're going to be able to place them with these incredible facilities and labs up and down the state, partnering with faculty, students and others get the testing and certification done, the third party stamp of approval, and get them out into the marketplace. And, and we believe that it's gonna add an incredibly rich layer to an already rich ecosystem for entrepreneurs in California that you all and others have built. And we manage through the Cal Seed Fund, but we're very confident we can also use it to leverage um, the, the range of university campuses, the 10 that were mentioned, the two labs, and other testing facilities that exist in the state over time will build into this network so that we can also engage um, disadvantaged area communities, zip codes that aren't sort of known as hotbeds of commercialization of technology, some of the campuses that haven't really been part of this conversation to date, but have students and faculty that want to be engaged in testing and certification from Merced and Riverside and, and points all around the state. Um, we are confident that this program will allow us to be placing entrepreneurs, matchmaking the right startup with the right test beds and building out that ecosystem so that we actually have a more vibrant uh, flow of companies through the process over time. And this initiative is going to be kind of key lifeblood to that. So that's uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Anyone else? Anyone on the phone? And then transition to commissioners. Um, I'm the lead in the R&D area. I think this is, gonna, is a valuable effort. Uh, certainly, we've been trying to really grow the industry, move things out from the lab into business. Um, obviously, that's hard and interesting to see how this tool helps. So anyway. Uh, I will move approval of item 12. Mm -hmm. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 This passes 5 to 0. Thank you. <coughs> Let's go on to the minutes, item 13. Move the minutes. minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes approved, five to zero. Lead Commissioner, presiding member reports. Commissioner Scott? Okay. So uh, this is our end of the year business meeting. So I have a, a few more remarks for you all uh, than, than usual, but excited to, to get to make them. And, and thank you, Chair Weiser Miller, for making time for us to talk about uh, the Commission's accomplishments and to acknowledge our staff. Um, 2018 has proven to be an exciting year on the transportation front and a great milestone for us here at the Commission um, because it marks the 10-year anniversary of the Alternative and Renewable Fuel and Vehicle Technology Program. And over the last 10 years, we've administered nearly $790 million in projects that are transforming transportation across the state. And these projects are also reducing both greenhouse gas emissions and pollutants that harm public health. In March, we had a celebration to commemorate a decade of clean transportation investments, and we were fortunate to have Speaker Emeritus uh, Fabian Nunez and uh, Secretary John Laird 
um, whose vision for uh, was the impetus for the program. And they both came and participated in the celebration and said a few nice words. We were also joined by uh, Senator Skinner, which was, was fantastic. And uh, we were, we were um, fortunate enough to have a resolution celebrating the program as well that uh, Senator Skinner, Senator Wykowski, and Assemblymember Bloom put together. Um, so that, that, that celebration in March was, was great fun. And as we all know, though, there's a lot more that needs to be done in the transportation space. So we look forward to 10 more years and maybe more. Um, this year, Governor Brown, as you know, continued with an aggressive transportation agenda for the state. And most notably, at the beginning of the year, he issued an executive order calling for the accelerated deployment of zero emission vehicles and the enabling infrastructure. And as a result of California's continued commitment, we are seeing the transportation sector rapidly evolve to clean transportation future. In fact, we have gone past the half million mark in terms of light duty um, electric vehicles on our roads today. So it's really exciting. We're about 512,000 on the roads right now. Um, and that's up from 340,000 at this time last year. Our zero emission infrastructure teams, including both our hydrogen team and our uh, plug-in electric staff, have continued to work hard to ensure that we grow the necessary infrastructure um, to make sure that we support these number of vehicles as they come. And on the vehicle front, we've tried to be really innovative in our space to think about how to um, launch infrastructure. So in December of last year, we launched the Cali VIP, which is the California Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Project. Um, to really help uh, in a very simple way. You just meet a few criteria. Um, if you're a property owner, uh, send us the, the photo of your charger in place, we'll send you the, the dollars um, to get the charger out. Um, we have also looked at uh, some in-depth analysis. We've invented uh, the EVI Pro modeling tool. Uh, Noel Chrysostomo and Kadir Badir and others on the team put that together. That's something that NREL and others are using to determine how much infrastructure is needed, not just around California, but around the country. So it's very exciting. Um, we've also worked with, um, provided some grants based on the, uh, the EPIC challenge, right? So we want nine EV ready communities and um, really ask communities to develop for themselves. Where would you like to put charging? Why would you want to put charging there? Develop what that plan looks like. And then our vision is the next round, similar to the EPIC grants, um, we'll be able to provide dollars for folks to implement those, those charging infrastructure plans that they put together. So we're really trying to be creative in the way that we roll out infrastructure in the state, in addition to using our traditional you know, solicitation for Electrify I-5 or Electrify I-80. Um, so I, I'm really excited about the team, um, so I want to thank Jennifer Allen and all of the electric vehicle team for the work that they do there. Um, this year we've also seen California's hydrogen refueling network continue to grow. Um, four new open retail stations that were funded by the Energy Commission and one privately upgraded station. So that brings our total retail station count to uh, 36. There are about 5,500 um, fuel cell electric vehicles on the road. More models are coming, so that's very exciting to see. Uh, recognizing that hydrogen supply was becoming a challenge to the expanding network, we also funded one renewable hydrogen production plant with plans to fund a second. And so I'd like to thank Gene Peronis and the hydrogen team as they continue to do the terrific work that they're doing in this space. And we've put together um, our, our usual AB8 report, which goes to the legislature and lets them know um, the status of the fueling infrastructure. In June, Air Resources Board puts one together that talks about the, the number of cars. Um, so take, you know, take a look at all the authors on, on that report. They've done a great job in the hydrogen space. Um, I want to say thanks to Elizabeth Chirac because she's really stepped up and created a very exciting and replicable program for turning over the state's oldest and most polluting school buses to cleaner zero emission buses, which is our school bus replacement program. Her team is very passionate about the program and she encourages them to think outside the box and deploy as many buses as possible with the 75 million that the Energy Commission has. Liz and her team should be commended for creating a robust program on an aggressive timeline that already has significant interest from school districts across the state. Another area of continued focus for us this year is the medium duty and heavy duty vehicle space. And we continued our engagement with six major ports in California, uh, Port of San Diego, Port of Long Beach, Port of Los Angeles, Port of Wainimi, Port of Stockton, and uh, Port of Oakland. And they've really been great partners for us in, in testing out um, 
the technologies. They really take them for, I call it the shakedown run, even though it's not a boat. Um, <laughs> they, they really take these out, kick the tires, see what works. How do the drivers like them? Are the cup holders in the right place? Can they see out the back window? Are the cords for the chargers long enough? You know, really test these uh, vehicles out so that um, they can go from the demonstration phase right into, into deployment once we've kind of worked out the kinks. And so we appreciate the partnership uh, with our ports. Uh, ben Dialba, Ray Gonzalez, Kyle Pratt, Mike Gravely, and uh, Tim Olson have demonstrated great leadership on these initiatives. And Tim also helped us put together a mini um, technology merit review to look at lessons learned to help us inform our future um, manufacturing solicitations and also our future uh, workforce dollars. And we've also had some management changes in the fuels and transportation division throughout the year, and so there's certainly some well-deserved acknowledgments there. I want to thank Elizabeth John. She stepped up and served as the office manager for the whole division for the majority of the year. Her balanced demeanor, thorough explanation, exploration of grants, and knowledge of the transportation industry have proven to be a huge asset to the division and to the Energy Commission. I want to thank John Butler, who seamlessly stepped into the role of acting, acting deputy director for close to six months. He successfully kept the trains on schedule, as it were, and ensued continuation, uh, the continued flow of our solicitations. His expertise with grants and dedication to prudent use of government spending continues to serve the division and the commission and our state very well. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge Kevin Barker, who, is long, uh, who has a long-standing history here at the commission, but uh, only recently joined our team as the deputy director of the Fuels and Transportation Division. In a few short months, he has been in this role. He has already demonstrated an ability to bring new and innovative ideas for program implementation, and I'm just delighted to get to work with him um, in, in this new role with the Transportation Division. I'd like to mention just a, a, a few other folks, um, Siva Gunda and his team, um, especially for stepping up the game on our alternative and renewable fuels component that we have in our uh, demand forecast. They've really done a great job there. Our terrific public advisor, Alana Matthews, for the great work she does every day in making sure the public knows how to engage with the Energy Commission. It's just invaluable to make sure that people know when and where to um, engage with us and how. And also for the lead that she took in pulling together our Disadvantaged Community Advisory Group, which as you all know is required under SB 350 and was developed in coordination with our Public Utilities Commission. I also served in my second year as the chair of the Western Interconnection Regional Advisory Body, or YRAB, <laughs> and I'd like to thank uh, Grace Anderson, Al Alvarado, and their team for continuing to ensure that I'm prepared uh, for those meetings. As, as you all know, there's all kinds of interesting things that take place in Western politics, um, and, and making sure that the West is speaking with, with a, um, an aligned voice on many Western issues is, is really important, and I'm, I'm glad that I get to, uh, to be part of that. I want to thank Melissa Jones Ferguson from our media team. She has worked to highlight our program, the Alternative and Renewable Fuel and Vehicle Technology Program. Um, and also Barry Steinhardt from OGA and his whole team, as they always continue to keep us up to date on the latest and greatest when it comes to ledge efforts. I want to thank um, all the folks that you see sitting across from us, although they're not, not <laughs> they're, they're not all there, um, but, but uh, Drew Bohan and Courtney Smith, Courtney Baccaro and Alan Ward, thank you for the thoughtful leadership that you display um, day in and day out. And uh, certainly last but not least, I have to mention my terrific team, uh, Retta DeMesa, Matt Coldwell, Claire Sugihara, um, and Monica Shelley. It, it takes a village um, to, to get all of the things done that we do every day, and I certainly couldn't do it without uh, the village that I have, um, and I'm really lucky to, to have mine. Um, and of course, um, all of you, my colleagues that I get to work with on a day-to-day on -day basis, I couldn't ask for a, a better set of commissioners to work with. Um, I wanted to just highlight for you um, uh, just one thing that I did between uh, our last business meeting and this business meeting, which was a chance to visit the uh, LA Auto Show. Um, and, and that was really great. It's, it's always interesting to see all of the different types of vehicles, have a chance to hear directly from the auto manufacturers what they're thinking about. Um, and there were, there were a couple of themes, um, and you may have read some of the, the news articles. Mary, Mary Nichols pointed some of this out. Um, there continue to be um, innovations in the internal combustion engine um, area, right? They're, they're, they're working hard to sort of eke out every little bit of efficiency um, that you can get in that space. And we did, we did see some of that, including a new uh, engine combustion technology. 
Um, there are, I think, almost every major auto manufacturer, there was the global auto manufacturer, so each one of the folks that we talked to have a, a plug-in hybrid at least um, on the way. Many of them see the plug-in hybrid sort of as a way to put your toes in the water on your way to electrification. Um, and so that was pretty intriguing. And they're all kind of in this like 18 to 27 mile range is how much that uh, the electric component of the plug-in hybrid would be. And they're thinking a lot about how do you advertise those to, to the mass market because they don't want people to think that your car only has a 20 mile range, right? <laughs> um, but they, they feel like that's kind of the sweet spot in terms of being able to do most of your driving in the electric um, space. And then for those times when you need to go on a, a longer trip or a family vacation or something like that's so when your gasoline engine and that plug-in hybrid would kick in. Um, it was great to see um, Outback, Subaru Outback is now gonna have a plug-in hybrid version. So we're starting to see more come out in the crossover space, which is terrific because as you know, lots of folks in um, California and around the country like larger cars. So it's good to see the technology making its way into larger cars. Um, and then the other observation that I would share from the auto show is, um, so we talked with some folks in uh, Nissan Leaf and others, and what they're trying to do is, for the, so if you think about the shape of the Nissan Leaf, the first version, kind of like the Toyota Prius, had a very unique shape to it, right? And so early adopters want that. They want to have that kind of, so that you can tell that they're, you know, they're the early adopters, they're driving the coolest, newest technology. As they move into the mass market, they really kind of want to make it look like a regular four-door car. <laughs> and so there were more uh, manufacturers kind of talking about how they're moving from that early adopter fast follower into the mass market, and they're sort of making the cars look, and think about the, the transition that you saw the Prius go through, right? Um, they're, they're, they're making them look more like your sort of basic four-door car so that it appeals more to the mass market but brings this technology there. So that was... Um, Really, really kind of a cool thing to get to, to see. We'll start to see um, many more models coming on between now and 2021, 2022. So it's exciting. And then just a quick um, wrap up. I wanna give a special thanks to my advisor, Matt Coldwell. Um, Matt has been an integral part of my team for the past two and a half years. Always eager to delve into any project that I threw his way, continually providing invaluable input and consistently delivering excellent results. Um, I'm really gonna miss him. Uh, he's transitioning to the Energy Assessments Division, so I'm excited for him. It's a, it's a really fantastic opportunity, um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that at our, at our meeting here. Uh, so we'll, we'll see him in the Energy Assessments Division working with uh, SEVA, so delighted for that opportunity, and uh, sorry to see him go from um, my office. He's, he's done a fantastic job. That's, that's me. Well, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I wanted to just thank my staff as well, um, I, I, and I'll do sort of global thanks, and, and maybe not tick off the longest list of the of the, the largest division, which uh, is the efficiency division. Um, but we have accomplished an amazing amount this year, and uh, you know, it certainly starts, I think, or at least uh, it's assisted by leadership at our level. Actually, it doesn't start by the leadership; it starts with staff, and starts with all the wonderful work they do to lay the groundwork for then what we get to you know, carry forward as, uh, as commissioners in our respective areas. And so, um, you know, my uh, direct staff, um, Martha and Brian, Martha Brook and Brian Early, and uh, also Laura Castaneda, who's uh, replaced Donna, who all of you knew, who, who uh, retired mid-year. Um, and actually, she still does her Christmas party, so that was, that was a good one this year. Um, but uh, we, st we still miss Donna and her, her, uh, her just character and personality and, and uh, just optimism. Um, but uh, Laura's doing a great job, and uh, really happy to have a, a, a solid team in my office. They've, they've just done a lot, of, a lot of heavy lifting this year. And then on the division side, uh, the, we have new leadership, Kristen Driscoll. Obviously, uh, she's doing a great job, stepped into uh, David Shukian's uh, foot, feet, shoes um, after uh, uh, he retired earlier this year, not too long ago. And so the continuity there has been great, and we've continued to really uh, get stuff across the finish line routinely. Um, most recently, the Building Standards last week, the Building Standards Commission. So we're all really happy about that. Um, it was really a big, big step forward and a lot of innovation on that front. Uh, and I wanted to thank Christine Colopy as well, uh, who uh, also uh, leads the division with Kristen and um, is uh, just a jack of all administrative trades, I think you'd sort of call her. She really knows uh, where, uh, you know, under which shells the, 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 the marbles are uh, all, all the time. And uh, so it's really, Good to have her uh, continuity there. 
Um, and uh, Amber and Al on the uh, media side, they really helped a ton, and I'll reiterate with Barry as well um, on the, the legislative side. Really lots of challenges. We have, we have a great legislature. They're doing a lot of amazing stuff, and it's almost hard to keep up with. <laughs> so, you know, Barry works with my office really well, and Brian and Barry uh, really have tag teamed a lot of good stuff uh, over the last year. Um, and I also wanted to uh, thank SIVA as well, just uh, on the forecasting front. We had a great workshop the other day and on ma multiple fronts in the Energy Assessment Division. Um, I think uh, him also stepping into Sylvia's shoes uh, mid-year, um, he's done a great job of getting continuity and really sort of rethinking some of the processes there and, and making that, that uh, division function well and sort of, uh, you know, gather steam, really. And I think um, it's really, it's noticeable every day. It's just sort of the, the progression, the positive progression there. Um, let's see, uh, we have had a lot of accomplishments in the efficiency division this year. I'll just highlight a few of them. Uh, you know, building standards most recently, number of appliance efficiency regulations, uh, one uh, uh, today obviously we just voted on. Um, the climate action plan I wanted to highlight. Um, I think uh, Eugene Lee and his team have done a really great job on that and sort of multifamily buildings and the low income aspects, low income multifamily are just huge, huge challenges for our state. We have to focus on going forward in 2019. Uh, so hopefully we can see, we can engage the legislature on that as well and, and uh, really find some solutions for that big sector of our populations. Um, let's see, um, on the, uh, Prop 39 front, we wrap that program up, and I uh, agree, Liz Chirac has done a great job for you. Well, she did a great job in the, in the efficiency division for years under the Prop 39 program, and that, that whole team, uh, I think, really ne didn't miss a beat in the transition for that program uh, from uh, schools to school buses and, um, uh, you know, really giving uh, competence, ongoing competence to program administration, which I think we've shown, you know, over the last few years that the commission is uh, now extremely capable uh, of you know administering these big statewide programs that move markets, um, so I think that's a that's a, a deep skill set that we've really developed and cultivated over the last five years or so. I think all to the good. Um, let's see. I guess I'll um, well. I wanted to thank Drew as well um, for just all his leadership and. Um, just paying attention to so many details, I really don't know how you do it. <laughs> how the, there are a lot of plates, you know, spinning at any given time, and, and Drew seems to understand, you know, all, all where each plate came from and, and what its history is and how long it needs to spin and all of that stuff. So, um, uh, really, I think the, you know keeping the trains running on time in this building is uh, an amazing accomplishment, as well as keeping um, a good eye on what's coming, you know, what's coming down the road and, and what's outside the building and, and who our key stakeholders are and will be going forward. So. Um, Really, thanks a lot, and I really enjoyed our, our visit up to Paradise, actually, together over the weekend. Um, let's see, a few things um, that I want to just highlight over the last, since our last business meeting, hasn't been that long. Um, the, uh, wanted to just uh, highlight for all of you that um, uh, I'm on the board of uh, NASIO, actually chair of the board of NASIO, the National Association of State Energy Officials, and we just kicked off a joint activity with NARUC, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, um, to look at distribution system planning. Um, and it, it, I think uh, California definitely uh, will participate. We're looking for about 15 states, I think we have them by now, um, to really focus on um, distribution systems, which are increasingly the focus of uh, energy system planning. I mean, you know, ISO might disagree with that, but I think there's a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, you know, it's all important, right, up from the, the uh, highest voltage transmission and, and regionalism all the way down to the end user. I think distribution system planning is, uh, up to now, has been kind of underappreciated, and we're trying to focus on that and help other states and PUCs and, and energy offices focus on that. So California is a bit ahead of the game, um, and I think has a lot to contribute to that. But socialization of that uh, distribution system, the importance of the distribution system is, uh, I think, really what this task force and this uh, joint effort with NARIC is all about. So um, I have a lot of uh, um, hope for that uh, moving the needle nationwide. Um, I, I've given a lot of talks lately, and uh, I'm kind of interested in what you guys, uh, what my colleagues here on the dais uh, think, but I, I really am heartened by you know, many of the events that I go to and um, the talks that I give, the audiences are younger than they have been in years past and more, um, you know, maybe that's just contextual to the things that I'm doing um, uh, specifically, but 
there's so much interest in our youth and our kind of you know master's student level um, uh, student population and just so much interesting innovation out there in the marketplace and it's engaging a bigger and bigger group of of, of people you know of all ages but you just notice it at the schools I gave a, gave a couple talks uh, last week uh, actually rapid succession the same evening over at the energy and resources group together with Carla and Louise Bedworth uh, we did sort of a a panel about you know energy topical energy uh, issues in California, um, so that was like old home day you know lots of familiar faces uh, and then right after that went over to Maggie Winslow's uh, energy management program at USF and she's an ERG alum as well and now has this really beautiful program over in the city that um, is attracting an incredibly diverse array of master students and so. Um, that, those are just two examples. A uh, week before that, I went down to um, um, a, a meeting organized by a little sort of mini conference at Fresno State, organized by Consul and the CBIA and, uh, and Fresno State and DeYoung Properties. And they, DeYoung has a zero net energy you know, development that they're doing uh, down in Fresno. Uh, so that was kind of the, the reason for that location. But uh, it was, they have an energy or a building management, construction management program at, at uh, Fresno State. And these students are so into energy and sustainable building. It's uh, it's really incredible. It's beautiful. And these are folks that are going to be out there as construction, you know, managers, and and uh, you know they're going to be out there with the hard hats on building stuff. And uh, and it's really great that they have this core knowledge and interest in sustainable building. Uh, so anyway, th that's a theme that seems to just be growing, and it's it's it gives me a huge amount of optimism for what we'll be able to accomplish in 2019 and beyond. Um, let's see. Um, I guess I guess that's it. I just wanted to particularly uh, thank uh, again the staff, the Building Standards um, Division, Christopher Meyer, and uh, certainly uh, Kristen and Dave before her, but uh, Christopher Meyer and Mozzie and Payam and, and the whole team there that's been working on these building standards for many years. Um, and we're we're sort of building on the shoulders of giants at this point. I think just with all the great history. Uh, that the building standards have in the state and um, you know I hear about it whenever we make a milestone I'm like hey I read the paper you know and, and wherever people are across the world really but certainly across the country uh, you know way to go there's a lot of a lot of we really need California to lead so that we can uh, move in that same direction you know the envelope gets bigger and people can move into the center and, and really advance in the right direction so um, I think uh, what we're doing here is just so important and uh, and the fact that we have processes that underpin it uh, and keep it robust and keep it really sort of defensible when people push back on it, I think is critical. Um, and it takes uh, a lot of people, you know, I always get, uh, when I go to NASIO, you know, and say, oh, well, we, we introduce ourselves in our energy offices. Oh, yeah, well, we have 700, 700 FTEs at our, energy, our state energy office, and, you know, and some of the states have half an FTE or two FTEs. Uh, you know, NYSERDA has a few hundred, but uh, we're, you know, the biggest energy office. And, um, uh, you know, people look to us to lead. Uh, because we do have a lot of things going on that others really can't manage. And so I think uh, that heightens the obligation to do it responsibly. Um, any, anyway, so um, 2018 was a great year, a lot of big milestones, and looking forward to working with all of you on the dais. Um, Drew, Alan, Courtney, um, and uh, really everyone here for, uh, for another great year. We have another new governor coming up, <laughs> and we'll see how things change, probably qualitatively, but I think the direction will continue on in the same, same general uh, um, direction so thank you all right well I will wrap some of my year-end comments in a brief uh, report uh, general commissioner report together and, and uh, I also want to recognize the hard work and long hours put in by the Energy Commission staff and and uh, to offer my own appreciation and thank yous for that work. Um, I'm going to really focus my comments on uh, STEP, the siting division, and, and siting and planning um, work and associated work. So um, we've had a lot of amendments and a lot of compliance work go through um, the Energy Commission, and the staff has been on it and, and uh, doing good analyses and, and also uh, working on just just efficiency of the process and, and um, so that's been I think really strong. In addition to that, the Office of Administrative Law just approved our rulemaking package to update the siting compliance regulations. There was a lot of work that we put into that. We also um, had a number of workshops, engaged with stakeholders to get input and I think that package will both 
improve our efficiency and also help us uh, strengthen the, um, help, help us really kind of focus on the amendments that uh, need more focus and be able to uh, facilitate updates that are more technical in nature and do those more efficiently. So it's, it's a nice, uh, nice package. Um, last year we approved an interagency agreement with the California Public Utilities Commission under which Energy Commission staff provide technical assistance and support to the CPUC to prepare California Environmental Quality Act documents and transmission planning analyses. Um, last, sta last month, staff completed their first CEQA analysis under that agreement with the publication of the initial, initial study slash mitigated negative declaration for the Ravenswood project. So that was a proposed upgrade to 1.6 miles of PG&E uh, 115 KV power lines in San Mateo County. Staff's now working on their second CEQA analysis under that agreement with the Vieira Reinforcement Project. Um, that work has gone well. The relationship building um, between the CPUC and CEC staff in order to be able to work jointly or, or, or coordinate, have the Energy Commission do the environmental work, but in close coordination with the PUC and um, efficiently and, you know, get, get the work done um, has been really good. And, you know, the Energy Commission staff have had to learn about the PUC process and how the PUC both administratively and in terms of their CEQA process, how, how they work. And so it's been um, a learning curve as well, not so much on the environmental review side because we do that, um, uh, you know, very well, but on the uh, just process side. And so that's, uh, staff's really stepped up there. Um, I want to thank and uh, in general, you know, we have so many people doing this work that I haven't been listing <laughs> names in the division, but I, I'll say for the much smaller cultural unit, um, Tom Gates, Gabrielle Rourke, uh, Matthew Braun, and Jessica Bonitz have done really great work, um, not only in, in the fundamental cultural resource analysis that goes with uh, environmental review, but more visibly to me in our outreach to Native American tribes. We completed an update of our um, tribal consultation policy, and um, on November 26th through 28th, the Energy Commission helped organize the first ever tribal energy summit, which was a leadership level state and tribal dialogue on energy. And so um, Commissioner Scott was there, and I attended. Two commissioners from the CPUC attended, uh, Commissioners Rex Schaffen and Randolph. We had high-level staff from the independent system operator there. And we had a really good discussion with tribes about their energy aspirations, how the state works in energy. We had a number of staff from different divisions throughout the commission support that by attending and by <coughs> helping provide information and service resources to tribes that attended the summit. Uh, it was a great uh, step in the commission's um, ongoing work and relationship with Native American tribes. And so I was really pleased about that, and Drew attended that, so uh, it was great to have our executive director there as well. Um, let's see, as part of our planning work, we participate in the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force for California, and uh, I've been the task force member, and, and really I've been playing the role of the point person for the administration on the task force. We have a number of state agencies also on the task force, and the Energy Commission staff have been instrumental in the work and the role that we've needed to play to step up and coordinate between state agencies to try to develop a state voice on the question of offshore wind that reflects its energy potential, um, environmental considerations, and the need for robust public outreach and community dialogue, tribal outreach, uh, stakeholder outreach, and so on. Um, so as, as I noted, we've really relied heavily on staff in the siting division to support us in that effort, particularly on the outreach and science side and they've been invaluable. Um, lastly, I attended the Western Regional Partnership Forum on November 13th. Um, it's a 
really important way, as Commissioner Scott, I think, knows well, and of course all, all of us really do some of this uh, inner uh, regional coordination, but it is really important to maintain these relationships. And I was just struck in that room by the way that, of course, many of our issues are not confined to our jurisdictional lines. And, and in fact, if you're trying to get something done that you know you may be dealing with, you probably will be dealing with, multiple federal agencies, multiple state agencies, and multiple states very often. And so knowing who to talk to, being able to um, learn from the experience of others, uh, having these relationships. Tribes play a, a big role in that as well. And so having the tribal and governmental and state dialogue about land-based issues and how they relate to energy was, uh, w was really great. Jim Bartridge has been kind of heading that up or, or at least provided me with <laughs> most of the support I needed and, and was able to attend that with me. So I want to briefly thank the attorneys, hearing officers, and support staff in the legal office who support the work that I've listed off. The uh, Christy Chu in her role as technical advisor to the commissioners on citing matters and the public advisor and her office for their valuable work. They were there in force at the Tribal Energy Summit. They've been working um, not only on the nuts and bolts of the office, although they've done a good job on that, but they've also stepped up to help us on, on uh, the, the Tribal Energy Summit, for example, being there, uh, the, the disadvantaged community work. And so we've, we've seen that office under Alana's leadership kind of step up and provide some broad support, and that's been really great. Um, uh, my uh, <laughs> executive assistant, Ali Owalowo, keeps me generally in the right place at the right time. When I'm not, it's probably my fault. And uh, my advisors, Jennifer Nelson and LeQuinn Wen, have uh, also <laughs> probably attempted to do that as well. Um, <laughs> not always successfully, but they try. Uh, so I'll, I'll join on the thanks to the executive office and, and chief counsel's office. I, maybe I'll, I'll just, the last thing, not only the chief counsel, not only the attorneys who support citing, but the chief counsel and the attorneys who support the uh, organization as a whole. As the attorney commissioner, I know that Many times the attorney's work is uh, invisible, and if it's visible, it's, it may be, you know, uh, not always, you know, advice is not always welcome or enjoyed by the recipients, even when it's well-intended and, and to the point and actually needs to be considered and followed. And so the, the chief counsel's office and the attorneys uh, provide a really important service to the Energy Commission, and they work really hard to uh, provide that service in, in the best possible way, and so we really value them, and I want to thank them for their work. So that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner Douglas. Um, yeah, I, too, uh, am very grateful, especially uh, Natalie Lee uh, taking over from Courtney uh, as Division Director of Renewables. You really have approached the job with professionalism and vigor and um, commitment to excellence, and I'm really grateful to you and the whole team. We had a fantastic uh, workshop two weeks ago on the vision of California becoming a, a lithium uh, uh, producer. We have enough lithium in the Salton Sea to meet one-third of global demand. Just the way that conversation was set up with the Salton Sea Authority and Berkshire Hathaway and all these other stakeholders, uh, I mean, that was run so well and set up so just for me to come in and facilitate, but all the details are taken care of so marvelously. It just really puts us in a great uh, position. So I'm just really grateful to, to you for the professionalism. And then Courtney and Drew, I've just really enjoyed watching your chemistry. I look for that in teams. And, you know, you had a great chemistry with Rob. And then Courtney coming in, you guys didn't really know each other that well, hadn't worked closely together. And just seeing that click uh, feels really good because I just, I don't know what you're doing, each of you, every day, but I just know that uh, every time I see you, you're, you're locked in and trying to make something better somewhere in the commission, and it's just great to, to see. Um, this has been an extraordinary year, uh, and it does feel like the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, I go to Paradise uh, frequently. My mentor and very dear friend lives there. He got out with five minutes to spare. His neighbors didn't make it. Um, no warning. They had uh, his wife smelled smoke, and they had just barely time to put the dogs in the truck and get out, and uh, everything got burned. His house miraculously uh, was saved. His barn burned down, and the reason was he he raises goats, 
And so this is actually, and in, in fact, earlier, two years ago, he had given me two goats. He offered me these two baby goats, and I stupidly asked my daughters if they wanted them. They're like, yes, and that was the end of my wife's you know, rose bush. But, um, uh, you know, actually, it's, it, it is an interesting, how do we become more resilient? So maybe a, a goat for every, uh, every household. But, uh, you know, smoke uh, canceled schools. My kids got sick. I mean, we're living with the consequences, and it feels to me like with climate change, we're one giant fire department. We have to have a fire suppression operation and a fire prevention operation at the same time. That's how I'm thinking about this work. And so the, even as we learn to be more resilient with the consequences, we still have to push really hard on the prevention side. And I am so proud. This year, um, as I've said before, we, we got more of the finish line than I thought would be possible. And, uh, and just, you know, I came back from Paris, uh, Ken, Ryder and I went to go speak in an EPRI conference, about 100 different utilities and other stakeholders over there. And just walking through what we're doing, uh, I mean, they're uh, you know, very clearly following really closely. And you just get the sense that what California does um, has reverberations all around the world. So uh, I do think that's an important part of the work ahead is continuing this incredible international engagement. engagement you know, the chair, especially with China, no more important uh, partner. Mexico and all the rest, um, and constantly thinking about how best to do that. And in fact, Danny Kennedy and I are actually starting, uh, along with Elaine Shea, uh, formerly with Verge, a, a new podcast uh, tentatively titled Energize America to tell some of these success stories. Uh, so we've teamed up with the founder of Radiolab, just recorded our first uh, pilot episode this week. Um, and just, you know, I think I'm just constantly thinking, how, do we, how else do we amplify what we're doing, even as we push forward? Um, I wanted to share just to have a really uh, a very poignant moment last week. The California Hall of Fame ceremony happened, which Nancy McFadden was instrumental in getting that going. And then actually she herself was inducted um, in memoriam. You know, Newsom was there, Brown was there, Laird, a bunch of others. And then this incredibly diverse and beautiful mix of Californians. So they had Robert Redford, you know, Joan Baez, Arlene Bloom was the scientist who fought uh, the toxic, you know, flame retardants in furniture. Uh, Velvet Davis, Ed Lee, um, and then Fernando Valenzuela, the Dodgers pitcher, who joked that this is the first time he'd ever gotten applause in Northern California. Um, <laughs> and that each awardee introduced the, uh, the next one. And so watching you know, Robert Redford get introduced by Fernando Valenzuela, it was just like, what a state. And then Brown was, the governor was kind of complaining, but he said, you know, I'm a minimalist. I don't even like these things, but I'm here <laughs> because of Nancy McFadden. So it was, it was very poignant and just made me feel really proud uh, to be a part of the state. Um, and I just, just did want to mark the occasion uh, what an extraordinary run Governor Brown has had. You know, uh, we've been here for these last few years, but really it's a 16-year chapter, in fact, including his father, 22 years uh, of just incredible, inspiring public service, and uh, what an inspiration. Um, and I ho hope that uh, that energy that he's put in is, is contagious. I know it is. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, I just wanted to, to also to thank my staff, uh, Kathleen, who's been magnificent, Ken and Tara, who outwork and out hustle me and out think me every day and love to have them on my team. Uh, and just so proud, just in renewables, you know, we have tripled renewables in the last decade in California. And now looking at electric vehicles, uh, you know, uh, monthly sales have, have increased three and a half times this year alone, you know. So uh, it is great to see the momentum, and I'm just really grateful. And I, I finally just want to say to Chair Weisenmiller, it is hard. Your job is harder than everybody, because I think there's you're, you're dealing with a bunch of administrative crap that um, you know, just falls in your lap, and it's hard. And I just want to acknowledge that I feel like you know, the important thing, we're a flock of birds, and the important thing is like the direction we're flying. But the one who's flying in front, you know, you're, the <laughs> you, you're having it to, to, to face the heaviest winds. And I'm just really uh, um, appreciative of all your, your hard work. So. Thank you. Um, I'm sort of doing wrap up here. So you know, I'll, st I'll start with my staff. I mean, obviously, my office does a great job making my life easier and keeping it more organized. Uh, Catherine, obviously, and Jan. Uh, Kevin uh, moved on to bigger and better things, but it was really phenomenal for Grant to come back, you know, and pick up basically double duty, uh, you know, and certainly Alana, Mike, you know, uh, it's it's a very strong team that you know we expect a lot from folks, and they they deliver. Uh, certainly, again, I'd like to reach out to the executive office. I mean, certainly Drew and Courtney and the whole team there. I mean, 
obviously Lisa, the audit team, I mean, key, key role. I mean, it's only on Paul and enforcement. You know, I just, uh, Albert in the communication shop, particularly proud of, of what we're doing on social media, you know, and that part, you know, of, of Vince and Katie really pushing that and others pushing the social media part of that, bringing us, you know, into a different era, shall we say. Uh, you know, I work a lot with uh, research and development, so certainly Laurie is great, her team's great. I think certainly one of the high points this year is the fourth climate change assessment. Uh, you know, that's been a huge lift by uh, Guido. I mean, that's been Guido's career, actually, the climate change assessments. Uh, Susan Wilhelm now, uh, Pam Doman from my office was editing every single report as we marched through, but, you know, again, that really set a bar. You know, I think all of us remember the New York Times saying, you know, quoting the governor, that in California, data and science still matter. And that's, that's really critical in these dark days now. I think in terms of certainly on the uh, assessment side, you know, I think SIVA is going to do wonderful things. I mean, obviously, Sylvia was great to work with in all these years. Uh, I was going to say I was going to flag Heather rate for the tracking progress. You know, I mean, that, that's been a, a huge lift. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, basically Al and Chris and Grace for their activity on, uh, we're looking at Northwest transfer capability. Uh, that's a key project as we look at some of the Aliso Canyon issues. Uh, and they've been working pretty hard on, very hard on that. Obviously Aliso has been something that uh, has very been important. We obviously miss Saul on those obviously bi-weekly calls and, and now Kevin, but certainly uh, Katie Elder and Ed have Randolph have really been on top of that as we go into the winter season, which is always a little daunting with as many pipelines out as there are out in Southern California. At the same time that, you know, we really had to limit the role of Aliso just dealing with the real reality there. Uh, as you said, international stuff has been critical. Uh, certainly, uh, my office folks, uh, you know, have really came for, for through on uh, the Germany-China, uh, Germany-California event. We've had the second one, looking forward to the third. I mean, a lot of, this, a lot of that was Kevin. Uh, certainly the China Pavilion was a uh, huge success at the summit. Uh, that was certainly a, a Michael, Alana, you know, whole team really pushed that along. Uh, you know, and certainly Brian Early has really helped on Mexico. Uh, you know, but it, it's certainly been a key part of what we deal with is trying to reach out globally and, as you say, amplify our activities here and other places. Um, I think sort of trying to, f oh, I was going to say, certainly want to thank the public advisor in her office, too, uh, particularly for their help on the Disadvantaged Advisory Committee, a group. And I really want to highlight Pam Doman's activity on the indices and certainly the Stanford interns we had in. Yeah, brought in a, a lot of energy, but really came for, for, through for stuff. And again, that's really want to encourage us to grow that relationship going forward. Um, hopefully I've hit at least the high points for folks. And again, we'd like to thank people for what's been a good year on stuff. Oh, I, on the indices, I was going to say certainly uh, cartography, geospatial data has been huge on that. Also, they've done a great job of me on, you know, trying to go through the state's power, gas, fuel, also now state facilities looking at the high fire risk areas. And so we can try to focus, should mention Justin, certainly Justin has really helped on the nuclear side and also on the emergency side, you know, that when uh, fires have been, you know, in terms of who's been called out to the emergency centers, it's probably Justin and his folks trying to deal with that or planning future emergency stuff. So again, certainly good year, great staff, uh, and need to continue to rise to the challenge of the times. So thanks. Uh, let's go on to Chief Counsel's report. Yes, uh, Chair and Commissioners, Courtney wanted to be here today to make a statement in person about two people in our office who were retiring. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it today so at her request, I will instead read the statement that she prepared. So, quote, with your indulgence, I'd like to take just a few moments to give special recognition and express my gratitude 
to two chief counsel office attorneys who will retire at the end of this month, Paul Kramer and Karen Holmes, both of whom have committed themselves to public service for several decades. In particular, I would like to recognize Paul's diligence and attention to detail in his work on the Commission's e-filing and docket systems. His efforts have significantly helped to ensure continuing transparency and public participation in the Commission's transactions of its business. Paul also distinguished himself as a tireless leader as the Commission worked at an unprecedented pace to process applications for certification of power plants during the availability of Federal American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funds. Paul was the hearing advisor on some of the most legally and procedurally challenging cases presented during that time and he ably collaborated with the assigned committees to meet aggressive deadlines while ensuring robust public process and integrity of decision making. Regarding Karen, her dedication and commitment to the commission is apparent to all who have worked or had the privilege of working with her. In the past four years or so that I have served as the chief counsel, Karen has been a beacon for me. And more importantly, she has been a steadfast anchor for everyone in the chief counsel's office and throughout the commission by one, providing thoughtful, considered advice and solutions and a never wavering willingness to collaborate with others to reach the best solutions for the commission. By two, consistently demonstrating the intellect and higher order thinking necessary for the creative problem solving. And three, by coming each day to this workplace with a powerful and undeniable generosity of spirit and passion for the work of the commission. So thank you, Paul and Karen, for your service. We appreciate you, end quote. And that's it for the Chief Counsel's Office. Thank you, that's great. Uh, Executive Director Report. Thank you. First, uh, I want to thank you for your consistent leadership up at the dais. Albert is finalizing our year accomplishments, as you know, and a lot of this stuff is really hard, and so I really credit your leadership for getting us through some very difficult technical challenges and uh, oftentimes some politically challenge, uh, political challenges as well. I've been really pleased to be a part of it. Also want to thank you for your show of confidence and, and kind words. We had some thank yous going around about the business standards, uh, uh, business um, uh, Building Standards Commission meeting the other day. Commissioner McAllister singled me out, thanked me, and I just wanted to say I felt like this was a marathon he started. Staff ran for the 26 miles and I was handed the baton at the last 100 yards and got to testify in front of the, of the commission. But it was a, a great accomplishment all the way around. I also want to thank you for acknowledging all the staff that you did through, uh, in your comments and many of them who have stood out and who warranted your, your particular commendation. But I also want to thank all those who you may not have come in contact with and who uh, contributed a lot of that, that really makes this commission go forward. We've got, as Commissioner McAllister pointed out, about 700 strong now. And uh, for every name that gets mentioned here, there are a couple, sometimes a dozen, sometimes more behind that person who really made that accomplishment possible. So we can't list all 700, but it's a, it really, things really are a team effort. Um, also wanted to just say that personally it's a joy working with this team every day. We've, we've got a diverse group. It's a fun group. I think most people who work here actually enjoy their jobs and enjoy work, interacting with folks. I, I hope that's true and I hope it, it continues. Got a long list, but I want to call out a few folks. First are Sylvia Benner and David Shukian. They both retired this year, as you know, and they had long and distinguished careers, and, and I thank them for their service. The three deputies that started uh, also this year, Siva Gunda, Kevin Barker, and Kristen Driscoll, they each bring a new perspe perspective. They all have very strategic orientations and think th about things strategically from staffing to the way we conduct our work, and they bring a lot of energy. So we're really fortunate to have them. Lori Tenhope got a mention uh, as well, and she's been the deputy I've worked with the longest. And she's been in her position now for the better part of a decade. And she's just extremely dedicated to managing a research program that helps California meet its many energy goals. Her steady hand has guided this division for a decade. Sean Pittard inherited a division that was going through significant change and continues to do so. And his calm determination has served this organization very well. He's, a, he's, a, he's proof that likability and good management are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> Natalie Lee, who Commissioner Hochschild mentioned, moved very easily and seamlessly from her position as the second in charge of the Renewable uh, Energy Division to the lead spot. She's embraced numerous challenges and is steadfastly working through each of them. Uh, I often characterize my job as keeping the trains running on time, but that 
that description really probably best belongs to Rob Cook. He oversees everything from the purchase of toner to the management of our budget, from the work of the EEO to the work of IT. We're very thankful that all that uh, quiet work you hope not to hear too much about is being done effectively. Paul Jacobs has built a well-oiled machine on the first floor. His work has sent a strong message to the appliance, man appliance manufacturers that following the law is really the best alternative. Paul takes a tough but reasonable approach to bringing companies into compliance. Lisa Negri, also mentioned, continues to perform excellent audits both of funding recipients and some aspects of our internal operations here. Her team helps us best manage public funds. Heather Rape, also mentioned, and her team sit quietly over in the corner there on the third floor and just year after year do a tremendous job of coordinating the massive effort we call the IBER. This year, her team showed their nimbleness as they worked with Commissioner Hochschild and his staff to adopt a very innovative volume one of uh, this year's IPR. Albert Lundeen, usually sitting across from me, I think he left a little earlier, uh, also deserves our thanks, keeps us on message. He's got a, um, uh, a uh, press release that's gonna go out probably just as soon as this meeting ends, and uh, he's got a great team he's assembled as well. Barry Seinhardt ma manages our relationship with the legislature and other outside stakeholders. This is critical to getting our agenda moved forward. He's very well regarded by the many professionals at the Capitol that we interact with, uh, and he's also built a great team. Justin also mentioned he's upped our game on uh, both nuclear issues and on emergencies. We hope we don't need him uh, for the emergencies, but if we have one, we're gonna be well served by having him in place. Also wanna thank Courtney Vaccaro and Alana Matthews and their teams for their excellent partnership. Since Alan's sitting here, I can't not mention that, but what a, what a great lawyer to work with. Well, first of all, Alan is a great lawyer, and he and I arm wrestle periodically uh, over things, but he just handles his job with grace and, and thoughtfulness, and he's motivated by trying to do his, you know, the best by the commission, and I can really thank him for that. We spent a lot of time together. Um, and then, uh, finally, I just wanna thank my team. First, Galen Cooper, who was a tremendous conscientious assistant who also happens to be one of the best editors in the building, a little known talent uh, to some. We lost Laura Castaneda this year, but she found an excellent home with Commissioner McAllister, and we miss her, but happy she's got an opportunity to, to, uh, to move up. Victoria Sandoval Moreno just joined us to take over Laura's responsibilities, and she's jumping right in. Shirley Wong Snyder is a re retired annuitant. I'm sure you've all seen her. She's uh, just a great spirit, great attitude, and steps up and does whatever's asked of her. And last, but certainly not least, I hope she's still here, she is still here, is Courtney Smith. She's coming on her one-year anniversary in this, in this job, uh, but it seems like she's worked here forever. I just can't imagine, uh, and I underscore this, uh, uh, working with a better partner, uh, and I can't thank her enough for all the things that she did. I just want to highlight one. Um, she took our uh, green team, and she kind of retooled it and re-energized it, and we selected a bunch of folks to, to participate in it, and they've put together a recommendation to take our second floor uh, cafeteria and that other room, and if you've been into the third room in the back there, uh, it's, it's not a pleasant place. And they've got an idea how, how to really revamp this place and make it an excellent spot for staff to visit and to get, get some work done and maybe have a little fun on their breaks. And uh, I'm really proud of that work and we're, we're, we're supporting, supporting those efforts. In closing, our goal as staff is to help you fulfill your goals. Uh, the one administrative item I'd like to call your attention to is IRPA, the Energy Resources Program Account, which you're probably sick of hearing about, but as you know, we made really significant strides this year in closing the structural deficit. It's not done, but we made a huge dent, a huge dent. So thanks again, and happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Uh, public advisory report. Thank you. So if Drew is job is to keep the trains running, I guess I have to help people know where to purchase tickets, find the schedules. <laughs> Uh, see if we have stops going everywhere throughout California, and it is truly a labor of love. I enjoy my job. I do want to thank my staff, Rosemary Avalos and Dorothy Marimi, who are both outreach uh, specialists for each division. Rosemary focuses on siding and renewables and natural gas, and Dorothy focuses on our fuels and transportation, energy efficiency, and as well as energy assessments. And they assist staff, I thank them for all the work they've done this year with outreach engagement and participation. And that usually involves researching um, various areas and demographics and compiling lists of environmental justice groups or energy equity groups and um, understanding how best we can interact with a particular community or organization that we wanna make sure that we are being inclusive of. 
A few things that I'm, I'm happy um, that we were able to assist with the commission, again, is the Summer Institute for Energy Law and Policy. I think it's great to have that pipeline of diversity, being able to bring high school students in. There have been a number of energy equity um, panels and discussions that I have participated and been happy to represent uh, energy commissions forward thinking on that. Um, I also want to thank Maria Norbeck, who is my new assistant, and she has helped transition our office to become a paperless one, so I'm happy we have a lot of documents that we have to store, <laughs> so it's all managed electronically now. Um, of all the things that I've had to um, be involved in this year, I think the discussions um, regarding energy equity is very important, and that's what I lastly want to highlight is because um, those conversations are changing. And the narrative of energy equity is really being driven by those in the communities facing that. And I wanna make sure that the Energy Commission as we move forward is aware of that and responsive to that. So a lot of times we may have a workshop or we are having um, a new policy that we're working on and we will invite members of that community maybe to attend or perhaps participate. And I really want to encourage, and the public advisor's office is here to support you moving forward, that we really engage those communities at the very beginning. So when we're looking at program design, solicitation development, or program development, that we're really looking at how we can engage in and not just saying, okay, once we figured it out, we'll just invite you. Um, that's the change as we can see on the national level, people feel they want to be involved. Um, and I ho I'm hopeful one of the highlights is the San Diego Sustainability Coalition, that's what they call themselves, but my office was very instrumental in bringing together, so just a group of individuals who felt like their voice may not necessarily be represented in our disadvantaged advisory group, um, being responsive, having a meeting, and we've had at least 30 um, representatives from state, local government, um, community-based organizations, um, and energy um, energy groups like the Center for Sustainability. Um, so very thoughtful and technical experts um, have come together and they've had a number, I think they meet every other month. And so hopefully that's a model as we begin to engage more communities to help them understand how they can better engage in our process and not from a standpoint point of just being aware, but understanding how to leverage that expertise and really say, well, this is what we need if we're looking at renewable or energy efficiency and things like that. So I think that pretty much uh, wraps up the highlights of things that I wanted um, to talk about. So thank you each for your support. So we will see that um, there'll be more um, input. Again, there's, I think I have staff that attends all the league commissioner meetings. So they'll only not only be raising the equity with regard to um, disadvantaged communities as well as low-income communities but also tribal communities we're very happy to start with that work and so we just want to you know lift that voice up to ask the questions how is outreach uh, being done or how are they being considered and if they're not we are committed to assisting staff with making sure that's done in a thoughtful and meaningful way thank you thank you we have two public comment please mr. Gore, come back come up Thank you, commissioners. Uh, last month I came to talk about power source disclosure during public comment. Uh, uh, Commissioner Weisenmiller had, had pointed out a enforcement office. I had contacted the enforcement office, but they had no knowledge of how to deal with uh, violations of Title 20, 1393. That's where they're supposed to send me a power content label. The other thing that struck me was um, and reading and in the transcript it says that uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Lee said uh, SMUD was allowed to aggregate uh, onto one label um, solar shares, green energy and such and that appears to be a private agreement and uh, I'm wondering what the, the commission Commissioner Douglas would say about uh, the maxims of jurisprudence, uh, 3513, uh, they appear to have waived my advantage in the law of knowing that power content label. Um, it, it troubles me. It, it, it troubles me. That's why I brought it up in the situation of uh, the SMUD uh, petition. 
Um, is this a situation of staff not realizing there's a regulation that says, yeah, well, we put uh, uh, an ID on every piece of equipment. And again, I'm after this power content thing, knowing, you know, what are they using to relate to uh, a piece of equipment? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding. And I asked for this allowing of SMUD, uh, a written document describing this agreement to allow them to do that. I haven't gotten that. I also haven't uh, uh, gotten uh, any reply. Now, maybe Ms. Lee is busy. Uh, I have solutions for reducing workload in that area because you're totally underutilizing inventory control systems. Uh, that would uh, free up a lot of uh, labor. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, they're advertising, SMUD is advertising uh, voluntary products, but not providing what 1393 requires. So I'd like to uh, know more about this uh, enforcement office. And uh, is there, uh, uh, is it a training issue? Maybe this person didn't know that there's a way of uh, handling a violation, uh, uh, alleged violation of 1393 of the Title 20. Um, I'd appreciate anything in there. Because I believe that if everybody in the state knows where, what's going where, we'll have more direct action from the consumer who makes the decision to actually burn the fuel. Thanks. Okay, thank you. We have one uh, gentleman on the phone. Hello, this is uh, Phi Nguyen from Energy Solutions, speaking on behalf of Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric. Uh, just want to uh, cap this with a thank you to the Energy Commission for a very productive year. Uh, a, a thanks for positioning California as national leaders in energy efficiency. Uh, the IOUs appreciate uh, working with the Energy Commission uh, in efforts uh, to adopt uh, efficiency standards that are practical and cost effective. Uh, the Energy Commission staff that worked with uh, regulations have acted professionally uh, and smart, uh, so nothing but uh, good things to say. Uh, as, and the California utilities look forward to working with the Energy Commission in the future. Thank you. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>